the show <laughs> we just wanted to wish everybody yeah, that's happy it. star wars no day. we definitely don't want to sit here no thoughts a little tipsy at all for and just talk star wars off by the way completely off the top of our heads yeah no notes um, uh caveman has done a little bit of research and that he's been watching some of the star wars movies over the past couple days yeah that's all i've been doing is just watching uh the uh prequel trilogy leading into solo and now you Almost got, done watching yeah, Rogue, Rogue One, One right before I started yeah. recording this, but yeah, just for fun, just to... I personally haven't watched any Star Wars stuff as of late, um, unfortunately. I've just been busy with other things. So I am coming in cold, but real hot with a lot of opinions, because uh, we fucking love Star Wars. Star Wars is our story. It is our... Man, it is our thing. I've got some nerdy tattoos. I have some Lord of the Rings tattoos, and I have some Star Wars tattoos. Uh, Caveman has uh, some Star Wars tattoos as well. I mean, we've got the ships on the back of our car. We've got a wall full of pops that stare of, stare at us with their dead black eyes. Stars. How old do you think you were when you first watched Star Wars? So, I know it's probably so long ago. <laughs> it's weird because I really remember getting into Star Wars in middle school when they re-released um, the original trilogy um, back into the movie theaters. But it was, you know, after George Lucas had gone in and gotten all squirrely with them and added new special effects and extra scenes and, you know, some people think ruined them, some people think added to them. We are now just very aware of, like, the extra scenes that are so glaringly apparent because of, like, the CG and whatnot. But, um, yeah, so, like, really, like, sixth, seventh grade, I got super into Star Wars. But when I went to see A New Hope in theater for what I thought was the first time, I recognized most of the movie. And then I realized that it was something that I had definitely watched one or a few random Saturday afternoons when it aired on KTLA back when that was kind of a thing where, like, you know, local channels would air sci-fi movies on the weekends and sometimes it was star wars so like i i definitely know i saw star wars from a young age yeah i lost my train of thought sorry folks i had to sneeze um i'm a little snuffy today so if you hear a lot of so uh caveman how old were you when you uh remember star wars for the first time what's your earliest star wars memory I feel like I was born already knowing the story of Star Wars. Like we're all so born young. knowing the lyrics to Beatles songs. It's just in our DNA. It's now. just in there. Yeah. When did you first hear a Pearl Jam song? How old? Like you know, trying to go back and trying to remember it was what it was like in sitting. In 1992. Oh my god. <laughs> just sitting there, hearing something for the first time or watching something for the first time, and you. But the older you get, you forget what it felt like seeing it for the first time yeah. and how you react when you find out certain things i may have known before even watching it that darth vader was luke's father <gasps> he is spoilers <laughs> we're spoiling the hell out of star wars i i kid because everybody but, fucking knows that. and and when we say spoiling star wars we are spoiling anything that we've ever seen yeah i mean pretty much to every star wars thing that has aired up to whether this it's date a, in mid-April. Whether it's a movie or a TV show. Since it is Star Wars Day, we want to make it special and we want to talk about everything Star Wars. Mm -hmm. We are going to have a special guest on the show today. We are? Who? So my friend Joey is joining us today to talk about the stuff we haven't seen. Yeah, he's, he's big into the cartoons. He's R a good sweet guy. 
we're gonna we're gonna watch the stuff that that he's obsessed with um, because we aren't. Um, but we want to cover everything, and I think he's the he's the missing piece to the conversation. So just to get this out there on Front Street, um, Caveman and I have not watched a lot of the Star Wars cartoons. There's so much. Um, it's a, it's a deep lore that we've never really gotten into. I personally don't like any of the animation styles that they use. Um, so, it, and I've never been able to get over that. So I've tried to watch, uh, the Clone Wars. I've tried to watch Rebels. I've tried to watch any Ahsoka, you know, specific episodes to prepare for her show. Like I tried guys and it's just not, it's not my thing, but please don't come at me for that because I've had enough Star Wars fans in my life try to convince me to watch the cartoons, and they never have. So just just don't. I, please. Even I, I've watched the, the majority of season one, and that's it, because it's hard. Of what? It, There's a thousand oh, I'm cartoons. Sorry. It's true. There are a thousand series. Um, season one of The Clone Wars. Yeah. It. Uh, everybody always tells me, "Well, you just gotta wait. You just gotta get through the first two seasons. Yeah, season three is season great. Three. Then the writing and the animation but, like, is really but so. But then there's so like, many. But there's a lot that you need to know about. There's season like 50 one and two. episodes I gotta watch just to get to season three. Yeah, and and so some people say, "We'll just start with them and go back and watch the best ones." But then they list every episode. Yeah, like I, it's just sorry, dudes. It's not happening. <laughs> one cartoon though that we have watched and are obsessed with. We've actually seen a couple now. Is Star Wars... We got Star Wars Visions. Star Wars Visions. Yeah, I forgot the name of it. Um, and then Star Wars uh, Tales of the Jedi we watched. You watched all of Tales of the Jedi. I've only Actually, seen like I think one I or sh- two of the little I did shorts. show you. An, yeah. I showed you an episode. But Star Wars Visions, um, mainly because... Mainly the animation. Let's, again, let's go back to I really don't like the animation style of the Clone Wars or any of the subsequent shows. But Star Wars Visions was where, for the season one, they gave, what, like 12, 10, 8 studios I, in Japan? Sure. Oh, God. Uh-huh. Since this, okay. This I'm, no I'm notes. S- <laughs> starting over. I'm so Jeez. sorry. This is going to be so hard. <laughs> Star Wars Visions is this great show where they gave like eight to 10 um, animation houses from Japan the chance to do a star war, just whatever you want make, you know, it's as long as it's set in the star Wars world, do a star war. And they made little short animated films in that way. And then in season two, they gave somewhere around like eight to 12 um, animation companies from around the world, really famous ones like Leica, Um, the chance to do a Star Wars. And again, they made their own stories and released them all. And if you haven't seen them, I think the longest one is like 40 minutes. But for the most part, they're 10 to 20 minutes long. They're incredible. They're heartfelt. They're funny. They're sad. You'll laugh. You'll sob your fucking face off. Like, if you're a Star Wars fan and haven't watched Visions yet, I definitely recommend it. I'm not saying like, oh my god, you have to. But they are beautiful. Um, And and it's, it's totally worth, like, the barely hour that you spend watching, you know, some Star Wars stuff that is new and original and fresh and really, really beautiful. Well, let's get into the Star Wars we have watched, the Star Wars we are obsessed with. Um, I guess first, uh, my, you know, I, I was joking earlier about when when did I really remember seeing Star Wars for the first time? Oh, we never finished talking about that. Yeah, we're <laughs> this is going to be so this, much fun. This is this is what it is. This is Star Wars Day. Yeah. So we we're, are we're celebrating the day, everything. and we're just going to talk about everything. We're going to skip around. Through, and go back to stuff. We're going to go through the timeline back and forth. We're, there are things that we're just going to uh, rant about. Yeah. What makes us connect to these characters and these stories and the music, and the 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 visuals, but. <laughs> But it's going to, you know, we are drinking um, some of our favorite uh, mm-hmm. local beer. So um, I, my parents had the VHS, uh, the original trilogy on VHS. Which we have somewhere, right? Yes. Yeah. I keep it safe. Yeah. Um, because it is, it, to get one of these uh, copies, oh. it is the closest thing there is to the um, unedited version of the original trilogy. Mm-hmm. There's no added um, uh, effects, C- the CG Ewok characters. Songs there. 
Um, there's no Hayden Christensen. <laughs> there's no, you know, it is it is void of all uh, changes except for because it's a, I think it's an early 90s copy. The only thing they did was they put in the addition of the title A New Hope instead of it just being called Star Wars. Um, there's only one VHS tape of the original Star Wars that does not say A New Hope on it. And it's expensive if you go try to find a yeah, nice copy a on eBay. Yeah, collector's thing for sure. You know what we do have? Speaking of just really quickly, random collector's um, items and versions of Star Wars. Because we have a lot of them. We have a Super 8 version of Star Wars that we bought in a thrift shop in Port Townsend, Washington once. And uh, it's it's the whole reel, and it's not the whole movie. It's just like selective scenes. It's selective scenes, because that's how they were released originally. It wasn't the movie in its in its entirety. It's just like the kind of the main like you know the main hits. But yeah, like so we have a super eight version of it too. On just on top of all of the other, you know, like fun collect like Star Wars collectibles that we have, we found this super eight in a thrift shop, and I think it was like thirty bucks, and. Like, how can you not? As Star Wars fans, we had to buy it. It was cheaper than buying a Super 8 uh, projector. <laughs> projector. Yeah, we'll never be able to watch it. I'll never it, be able to watch it. it. Yeah, Super 8 projectors aren't cheap. So long story short, <laughs> I have I have liked I have been a Star Wars fan <laughs> since I was in middle school. Or let's uh, I I've been a Star Wars fan since elementary school. Young elementary school kid, and is um, being able to watch. Uh, VHS. Maybe we should have prepared for this. Maybe coming in hot was a bad idea. I mean... What's funny... Okay, so obviously I'm the one that keeps getting us off track. I'm sort of the Kevin Smith of this bitch right now. Um, if you've ever listened to a Kevin Smith podcast, you know what I mean. Um, but this is what it's like for us to talk. This is probably going to be the most real conversation that Caveman and I have. Possibly a little chaotic absolutely a little chaotic um but this is as, as real as it gets in terms of us just like you know getting a little toasted and then talking about the shit that we love so i, I hope you enjoy that of course uh for me growing up going into star wars it was all about princess leia um i i will love that character until the day i die that character means it's it's one of those like top it, she's my favorite character of all time of anything is Princess Leia. She is strong and bold. She's beautiful and badass. She's funny. She's heartfelt. I, I mean, we got Carrie Fisher for such a short time, and I wish we still had her. I miss her every day. And I never met her, and that's such a fucking bummer. But I miss her every day, despite having never met her, because Princess Leia means so much to me and so much to my little kid and... A lot of little girls around this world, so if nothing else, Star Wars gave me her, and I'm forever grateful for that. Since there is no structure to this podcast... None whatsoever. What's your favorite Star Wars movie? Oh, you motherfucker. I, oh, I, it's The Force Awakens. And a thousand people decided to rise up and start writing emails about why I'm wrong, but it's The Force Awakens. I'm a little surprised by that. I know you thought I was going to say A New Hope, and I knew you thought I was going to say Rogue One, but in my soul, if I'm sitting down to watch a Star Wars for no reason, it's The Force Awakens. I I love Poe Dameron. The way I just talked about Princess Leia is the same way that I love Poe Dameron. I was going to say, because Princess Leia is not in A Force Awakens uh, She's much. in it enough. She's not in it much. No, nope, she's not. But I get Poe, who is my precious space gay Hufflepuff. Like, the man is so pure, he's so in love with Finn, and I know it's canon because Oscar Isaac and John Boyega said these two characters are in love, and Disney can't do a goddamn thing about it. They can try so hard to make you think that Poe Dameron is straight, even by giving him a beard in episode nine, but if they wanted Poe Dameron to have a beard, they should have just had Oscar Isaac grow one, because we already know how <laughs> delicious that beard could is so yeah the the force awakens i got bb8 who is special sweet soft boy i've got kylo ren back when he was a little bitch which is what he should have stayed 
Ray, total sunshine, just a, a drop of golden sun that is Ray, who's so wonderful. And yeah, like Han Solo dies, and yeah, we see Luke Skywalker for six seconds. But man, The Force Awakens makes me so happy. And I will not apologize for that. So yes, that is my favorite Star Wars film. What is yours? I mean, The Force Awakens was a really nice, uh, easy film to put on in the background. It still is. It's it's We haven't it done it in a while. But... I watched it not too long ago, and it holds up. I was just as excited about every scene. It's a lot of fun to have in the background. But I feel... I... My favorite Star Wars movie has changed a lot over yeah. the years. As I grew up, as I as I become a bigger boy, I <laughs> I uh, my my taste in movies has changed, and you don't have the to filmmaking why. process. Yeah, but I first uh, Return of the Jedi was always my favorite growing up. It had the Return of the it Jedi had the coolest is, yeah. it had the some of the coolest action scenes. It had a lot of um, fun kid moments. I think, you know, especially with Ewoks, mm -hmm. um, little teddy bears running around um, murdering stormtroopers <laughs> is always fun to watch. The battle scenes in Return of the Jedi, especially towards the end, um, team effort it took to take down the second Death Star, all that was just a lot of fun and always my favorite. However, as I got older, Empire Strikes Back became my favorite. It has a lot of fun action. It kind of slows down with Yoda, but I have, with age, I have come to appreciate scenes like that with Yoda and not wanting just action, action, action. Because when you're younger, you don't care about the more serious, uh, good filmmaking parts of a movie. You just want to see... Ships fly, fly through space and destroy TIE fighters. Pew, pew. Exactly. Yeah. You want to see some lightsaber battles. Plus, this is the movie where you find out that Darth Vader is Luke's father. And so all of that really equaled me, this uh, Empire Strikes Back being my favorite. And then I got a little older. Yeah. And now it's gone to the original Star Wars being my favorite. And it still is to today even over rogue one even over rogue one oh, okay i mean i because there first of all rogue one's the best star wars film ever made it doesn't make it our favorite i think you're uh, yeah. yeah it's okay no no i get it why is a new hope your favorite now um because i really i'm because i'm getting more into the process and what it takes to make one of these star wars and especially back in the 1970s with limited technology a lot of the a lot of the cameras and techniques they came they up with created a lot of stuff to they make came movie. up with it and invented it yeah. there for the movie stuff and that's so common today has well and it's uh i mean it birthed skywalker sound it birthed Industrial Light and Magic yeah. was, ILM. which is one of the, which still does amazing groundbreaking work today. So they, they didn't stop in the seventies. They kept going. And when you, you know, when you know that the only computer that was used for the entire film was the one to make the, the show, the death star plans. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only, that's the only computer that was used to make everything yeah. is caught in camera. Their and models. So many great special effects that they created for Which the first time. Some it's... old techniques, too, from old Hollywood. Like, it's just why it's so... Like, they, they've they been able to do so much more with Star Wars. I mean, look at the volume. Look at the realistic CG and, like, the sequels versus, like, the really kind of rough, still very animated CG of the prequels. All that to say, it gives me a huge appreciation to the work that went into this first film and how it... Also, it was the film that, because it's the first, it birthed everything else yeah, that's been I mean, going on it, for we decades later. Yeah, I mean, without it, we wouldn't be sitting here. Like, if that movie had flopped, we wouldn't be sitting here. In general, our lives would be a lot different. Actually, if, if Star Wars wasn't a part of our lives, I think our lives would suffer in a lot of ways. But we would have subsequently have some more money <laughs> because we have a lot of Star Wars merchandise and tattoos. Um, but also, I'd, I just wonder if, there's a multiverse version of Maggie and Caveman who never got to see Star Wars and whether or not they're as happy as we are now. 
Like we we just, got so much. We'd just be more into something else. Yeah, we'd be more into Batman or we'd something. Be, or, you know, a Time Cop, which would be that, that maybe era Robo of Star Cop Wars. would have been... <laughs> Robocop. The, the 11 movies and countless yeah. television shows. <laughs> the Robocop tattoos. I'm sure, let's do it. I love Robocop. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't. <laughs> um... So yeah, like I, I absolutely adore A New Hope. I, I, again, for the, all the reasons that you do. As a movie fan and somebody who appreciates the artistry that goes into making movies, I 100% agree with you. It is an incredible feat that they pulled off back in 77. Like, and well, that's when it came out. So like, you know, 75 to 77. Um, absolutely. And I love the story and it is so easy to still watch. And... But, like, honestly, if I want to watch A New Hope, like, I'm probably, instead of actually going and watching A New Hope, I'm probably going to go watch the Phineas and Ferb Star Wars special <laughs> because it runs concurrently to A New Hope, and I know that story so well that then I can enjoy, like, Pair of the Platypus running around, you know, the Death Star with Darth Doofenshmirtz and the songs, which are so much better than they have any right being. Like, I... I'm more likely to watch a spoof of like an, any of the uh, original trilogies before I am actually watching them because I've seen them so much. I mean, that shows you how big Star Wars is. It, it's been influencing sci-fi. It's been influencing other shows, not just kind of poking fun at it sometimes with things like Robot Chicken. Yeah, Family but, Guy. But then, yeah, fan, the Family Guy Star Wars trilogy episodes are fantastic. Uh, hilarious and um you know they they they're making fun of it but because they love it you know they're it's fun when you get to that kind of fandom it's okay to poke fun at your something that you love knowing and, and allow themselves to be poked fun of like they have to give well, these people they have the right to do which it is, yeah which is and and all of the people that are poking fun are fans so it comes from a very loving place um, like, I, I genuinely mean this. The Phineas and Ferb Star Wars spoof is not only the best spoof of Star Wars, but it's one of my favorite Star Wars stories. Like, Isabella having the, um, like, it's, I think it's the, it's not the aluminum chihuahua, but like, instead of the Millennium Falcon, it's the consistent chihuahua or something, like, and just, just all those wonderful little jokes they come up with. It, uh, it's so worth it. I love Phineas and Ferb, but that Star Wars special, it has to be seen. If you haven't seen it, put it on tonight. You'll love it. And, you know, Star Wars makes fun of itself in the way that they've kind of embraced uh, Life Day and <laughs> the Star Wars Christmas special. Christmas special. Is, oh, We could God. do a podcast just on the Christmas special and be so angry the entire time. We watched it one Christmas with my mom, who had never seen it, and I had never seen it. Okay, man, I don't know if you had seen it before, like, in its entirety. I don't remember. But there was a Christmas where, like, the you know, the kids were playing with their toys. My mom, came man and I sat down and watched the Star Wars Christmas special and just ripped it to shreds, and it was so much fun. It's so bad. It's so bad. Oh, it, it's so it's bad. It's so hard to sit through. And, but, you know, I, I think that these days Lucasfilm is like, yeah, we, we fucked up on that one. Let's kind of make fun of it now, and let's kind of make some of it canon, and let's kind of embrace life day which is i think cute and of course marketing and money but cute george lucas tried so hard to wipe Erase it off the, that yeah wipe it off the face of the earth and, and disney came along and went oh well the internet once it's on the internet it's true it's out there you can't forever. get rid of it yeah and the fans would have never let that die because as awful as it is there are huge fans of it who love there it. are but disney plus does not have it on their no, service. No, but they do have the Boba they, Fett They have cartoons. the Boba Fett animated um, segment. Yeah. But that's it. So, but the, like, the, the original trilogy gave us, has given us so much. It's given us so much joy. And I, I know that fandom these days can be so toxic. You know, people absolutely love something, but then they hate something else and it becomes such a huge part of them that they rile against it forever. Um, you know, like, there's no denying that the Star Wars fandom isn't hella toxic. It's toxic against women. It's toxic against people of color. It's toxic against the LGBT community. 
all of which, by the way, are a part of Star Wars and love it. And there are fans across the board, all sexes and religions and ages and genders and everything. Like, Star Wars is beloved by all, but the fandom is toxic and we're all very aware of this. Um, but that being said, like, we could have just had that first movie or we could have just had that first trilogy and nothing else. Like Star Wars could have stopped with Return of the Jedi and been something that kind of like a niche population loved and the rest of the world kind of acknowledged. And sure. now it's beloved by everybody. And we have, yeah, there are things that aren't great about modern Star Wars and there are moments I don't like. And there are things that I wish had never been created, like the fucking mods from the Boba Fett show. <laughs> I hated them so much. But that show also gave me Boba Fett robbing a train with a bunch of Tusken Raiders, and that was somehow something I never knew I needed. So, like, it's it's pros and cons, man, and you're allowed to like the stuff that you like, and you're allowed to not like the stuff that you like, but you're not allowed to, like, attack people for it. So, to all my beloved Star Wars fans out there, guys, like, calm down a little bit. Let's be more, like, accepting and have more fun. And not everything that is uh, produced needs to be for you yeah that's either. the other thing like just you could have watched the boba fett trailer and been like you know what no I, I don't think i will and that would have been fine so but instead there are people who just they have to watch it i mean they have to watch it and they have to shit they on have it. to shit on it and then they have to shit on you for liking it right because they don't like and they it. could have just skipped it all together yeah i you know i don't watch the cartoons the what's the newest cartoon the um the bad batch yeah I don't watch the Bad Batch. I watched the trailer and went, no, eh, that doesn't seem like it's for me. But I haven't then subsequently gone out there and shit talked it and complained about people who say they like it or anything. Like, I just, it's not for me. So I haven't watched it and I haven't given it any more thought. And people think it's great and good for you guys. Like, you get to experience a part of Star Wars that I don't. And I'm happy for you because you get to have something that you love. Just, you know, it's just not my jam. Yeah, I, I respect the hell out of the Clone Wars and what they've done, because I love the character Ahsoka. I think she's incredible. Have I only seen her in live action stuff and a couple cartoons? Yes. But I still think she's great, and I love what they're doing with her. And so it gives me, like, mad respect for the cartoons that I haven't watched, but it's still not going to make me go watch them. And when you're a fan of something, there's just no reason to be like, angry, angry or toxic. It just, it, you know, what is that? Yeah, what does it do? What is it doing for you? It just you? makes us all look bad. But, you know, in the end, man, I these stories make me happy, and they make me laugh, and they make me cry. They make me feel all of the emotions. Like, when Han Solo dies, my heart breaks. When Yoda dies, my heart breaks. When Darth Vader decides to save his son and throw uh, Papa Palpatine... Go for go Papa for, Palpatine. Go for Papa Palpatine. <laughs> go for Papa Palpatine. You have a collect call from... Darth Vader. Ugh, I, I gotta take this. Hold on. I, you know, I feel those emotions. I feel as giddy as I did the first time I saw them. You know, like the first time you hear the lightsaber whoosh. Um, or an Empire, that, that whole sequence with Darth Vader and Luke and their lightsaber fight. Like, I'm always into that because, fuck, it makes me so happy. And, you know, and every December after Christmas, I shed some tears for Carrie Fisher because, you know, that's as real as anything to me. Like, I fucking love these stories. And I'm just, I'm so happy they exist. <laughs> so, okay, man, I have a question for you. All right. Which might be a little hard because as I thought of the question and then tried to think of my answer... I struggled with it. But what is your favorite bit of Star Wars merchandise that we own? That's a tough one. That's we a, have so much. It is a problem. I may have too much stuff. Well, definitely. I think. It's... You know, I really, there are certain things that I kind of like um, above some other the stuff that we've had. Like one that you've already mentioned was the. The eight millimeter film yeah. reel of, Having that's really the, cool. of Star Wars scenes in um, uh, that's different and unique and kind of one of a uh, not completely rare, but it's one of a kind for me. 
Uh, another fun thing that I got the last time we were at Disneyland. Oh, um, yeah. I bought a Boba Fett helmet. Um, I always thought Boba Fett's helmet, ever since I was a kid, it was the coolest helmet in Star Wars, even over um, Vader. I thought he was a cool guy. I know he didn't do much in the original trilogy and kind of went out like a bitch in <laughs> Return of the Jedi. Uh, but Such a little bitch <laughs> in Return of the Jedi. But he, to me, he's always had a um, very unique helmet um other than that i mean there's some star wars legos that i have that i think are really unique and cool bb8 is cool because he his his head head moves and um you know i have the star wars helmet or lego helmets that i've tried to collect them all but there's too many and i'm running out of room and i think i'm done collecting those too yeah well i mean at least collecting we the cat. ones and we, we have, have a cat have that's a cat the now. most cat and legos yeah it's uh we don't have a lot of shelf space because of all of our random little collectibles and then throw in the cat who's just an absolute terror um you know what you know what the cat's favorite star wars merchandise is is we have a little stuffed wampa that uh, we got from probably like a loot crate or something ages ago that has always sat on our shelf and the cat discovered that and now that's one of his most favorite toys. He will throw it around the living room and then chase after it. It's so funny. Um, What about you, Maggie? You have something in this room that's... uh... Well, I have a couple. Um, I definitely have been given a lot of Star Wars art over the years by friends. Um, a lot of really wonderful artists out there have created really beautiful Star Wars prints. And a lot of my really gorgeous and generous friends have gifted me them for my birthday. And unfortunately, I haven't framed and hung them the way that I would like to, but they are all safe. Um, but yeah, I've got a really lovely you know, collection of portraits of Leia. Um, we have a framed print of R2-D2 and C-3PO dressed as the Blues Brothers. And it's captured, we're on a mission from Leia. Like, that shit cracks me up. I love a good mashup. Um, So, yeah, definitely the artwork that we've collected over the years, both on displayed and not displayed, makes me the happiest. Um, And then, so we have a a way, way too big Funko Pop collection that we are kind of trying to actively thin out a little bit because there are some that, you know, there are some some that that we don't need. More than, like, I have... I have certain ones that I just want to have, and that's mainly Stranger Things, Batman, yeah. some Marvel, Star Wars, and then Saga. S- yeah, a few other little yeah. stragglers here and, and there. And same, but like, but so we have a lot of Funko Pops, and we have a lot of Star Wars Funko Pops. But I have uh, the trio. I've got Poe, Ray, and Finn all wearing Poe's jacket. As Funko Pops, um, Funko released a pop of each of them in Poe's jacket because they all wear it at some point in The Force Awakens. And I have them all next to each other on the shelf where they belong, uh, my Jedi Storm pilot. So, yeah, like them and them in the jacket, really, I know it's silly and I can't believe that my one of my answers is our Funko collection. But, like... It, we've got a lot of fun ones. We have the entire Rogue One team. Which was not easy to get all six of them. It was not <laughs> easy. Um, Brody was a... Uh, Bodhi. Bodhi uh, was a character that... He was a Funko Pop that was very rare. And we had to hunt down. And the ones that are out of their box, there's, those are like the ones that I've decided... I don't care if these are out of their box. Oh, like, no. Yeah, they, that's totally fine. That a lot they of these... Live on the like some, some Funko Pops are still in their box. But for the most part... I, I really like opening them up. I like my action figures. Yeah. As you, as, yeah, you know, well, you I know, hold them. I know that there are a lot of collectors who are just like, <gasps> open the box. <laughs> what? Although and, we do have some pretty decent um, pops that we, like, uh, you know, we've got a collectible Count Dooku, and we've got a collectible uh, Darth Vader and Chrome. We've got a fuzzy Chewbacca in the box. So not all of them are out of the box, but there's a fair amount that we, and also it's harder to display, you know, you can put five boxes on one of our shelves or, like, nine pops by themselves. So it's a space safer to get them out of their box. We also have some random um, kind of Star Wars paraphernalia. Yeah. Like, I have a lot of uh, friends that e- either for my birthday or, th- or just they 
somehow got a hold of a Star Wars thing and they yeah. don't know what they don't want it. Comes our way. Like, um, hey, caveman, you want this? I'm not using. I I don't want it. And I yeah. know you like Star Wars, so a lot of it sometimes comes from them. But um, we've got some Star Wars playing cards that are pretty cool. Yeah, they're very beautiful. We've, we've got we've got course, a, we've got lightsaber chopsticks, lightsaber chopsticks, and uh, um, a, a, a Death Star herb grinder. Yeah, yeah, herb, yes, wink, wink, herb grinder. Um, yeah, we we've, we've got a lot of like random tidbits, and. Also, I mean, let's be real honest, we are ourselves walking Star Wars merchandise because I have two Star Wars tattoos. You have one, but you have kind of a big one. Um, I literally have Princess Leia on my arm. She she sits on my arm. And on the uh, flip side of it, I've got the Rebel Alliance symbol and Poe Dameron's black one X-Wing with BB-8 in it. I literally have a Princess Leia and Poe Dameron tattoo, and I'm not ashamed of either of that. I love my Star Wars tattoos. We also have no shame being in our 40s and still rocking a Star Wars t-shirt. Oh, absolutely. And I've gotten some great Star Wars mashup t-shirts over the years. Mainly anything that has to do with Poe's sweet and beautiful face. My favorite Star Wars clothing that I own is my best friend, Jesse. Made me a t-shirt of Cobb Vanth superimposed into a scene from The Office. And the t-shirt reads, I'm Cobb Vanth, Vanth Refrigeration. <laughs> and instead of Bob Vance and that's one of my favorite like dumb little jokes and she made me a t-shirt with that on it and I love it Jess I love that shirt so much um and the only time it's gotten a lot of love and appreciation is when we went to see Ahsoka on the big screen um last year and a lot of Star Wars fans understood it there but nowhere else uh, I have I mean I have on my wall I have a uh Han Solo frozen in carbonite that all it does is just hang on my wall kind of like the way he did in, <laughs> in Jabba's palace. palace. It used to light up but it, it doesn't used, light up anymore. It doesn't light up anymore. It used to, so he's yeah, just it used there. to light up red. You like know, he's heating up. Honestly, that's something that I could see going in the next move. Y- yeah, there's yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's <laughs> there's not a lot staying, of stuff. Or yeah, it's um, not coming with us. So yeah. But, you know, if you, you want know, anything, we... email us at <laughs> moviemigglepod <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> we might be getting rid of some things. Yeah, we might like a dollar a pop. <laughs> Somebody just give me a dollar for some of these and like, I'll I'll pay you to take them. No, I won't. I will <laughs> no. not. No, I we've will already not. paid too much for yes, them. Yes, I can't give any more money. Um, your, uh, your vinyl copy of The Force Awakens soundtrack is beautiful, too, because it has a hologram that as the uh, record spins, it looks like the Millennium Falcon looks is like floating above yeah, it. It's floating above the record. Yeah. And then on the opposite side is a couple of TIE fighters. Yeah. It's a, it's a really neat little thing that oh. the Disney Music Emporium was selling. I have a, on vinyl, I have... It's like a Star Wars storybook. Like, oh yeah! Like turn turn the page, page when, when you hear R two D two go bleep bleep bleep. <laughs> yeah, on re- on vinyl that I found in a thrift store. The fact that that's probably what it is, and we've never listened to it. And uh, no, I think that is what it is. Oh, is it? Because pretty... I was just making that up. No, I haven't listened to it. <laughs> but I was just making that up based on what I knew of those old it's story a quick, books. I don't I don't think it's uh I don't think it's one of the ones it's a read along, but it's it doesn't have the R two D two noise to turn the yeah. page. But it is a read along vinyl and it does a re- it's a real quick synopsis of the movie. Oh man, I own actually I don't own the Return of the Jedi one yet, but it has been released. But I own um from a certain point of view the Star Wars books that they put out where they asked uh, 40 different authors to write short stories in set in the Star Wars universe um, based on A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back and then now uh, The Return of the Jedi. And those books are beautiful and they're really, they're fun and they're sweet and again, they're they're happy and heartbreaking. Oh yeah, no, Cave Man just showed me one of my Poe Dameron comics. I've got almost the complete run of every Poe Dameron comic that they put out. I think I'm missing like two, which can't be hard to find in all honesty. I'm sure not a lot of people are into that. But uh, but yeah, like Will Wheaton wrote one that broke my heart and made me so angry at him um, about like a pilot who left Alderaan, who left his daughter on Alderaan to go fight for the Resistance, thinking that she'd be safe there. Like, I mean, shit like that, like really great stories. Um, I do own a lot of the, uh, any book that has Poe Dameron, except for his biography, because they tried to make him straight, and I refuse to believe that he is, so I didn't buy that one. Um, but... We, I mean, we've got 
coloring books and I've done paintings. Um, I've, done I've got this Star Wars balsa art. wood uh, 3D model that I haven't put together, mm-hmm. but it's of R2. Of R2. Yeah. And I'm just holding on to it because I uh, don't want to <laughs> ruin it. Like, I don't want to get it, have it ruined. Oh, um, and then there's like the, the visual books. I, like, not only like the Star Wars like dictionaries, up, but. Um, not too long ago when we were trying to do a bit of a purge through yeah. kind of the stuff that we have too much of in our house. A lot of collecting, so a lot of times we have some purges. Yeah. And recently... You, purge, you guys get it. Unfortunately, I'm a little bummed by it, but at the same time, I wasn't doing anything with it, but I had to get rid of my Star Wars Clue board game. I noticed that that was missing not too long ago. It, it literally, we never took it out of the package. It just, it was there for looks more yeah. than anything. As another thing that I didn't want ruined because I knew that inside you had to build like this 3D cardboard model of the Death that, Star. That, yeah, the Death there Star. There were so many pieces. The At the time when I bought it, I had little kids. Yeah. Now I have a cat and I was just thinking, I'm never going to play this board Did game. Did you take it somewhere? To... I sold it. Oh, nice. Well, look, I mean, things come and they go. We, we're it's sentimental just stuff. about the little stuff. It's it just is stuff. just stuff, yeah. But for the most, you know, I, I keep what I really want, yeah. and I understand that it's okay to get rid of um, the stuff that's just that's just piling mm-hmm. up. Once it starts piling up, you're like, all right, yeah, it's I got to stop. Go. It's, yeah. it's, it's one thing to be a fan, and it's another thing to be a little a little too obsessed. Hoardery. Hoardery. Yeah. yes. I don't want to be a hoarder. I'm more of a rebel girl. I'm rebel scum. And Caveman's more of an empire grunt, I guess you could say. Um, and when it comes to the ideas of cosplaying, um, when it comes to, like, like even, you know, our tattoos, like, his tattoo is of the uh, the ships in the Death Star Trench Run. But Caveman prefers, like, a TIE fighter to an X-Wing, and I prefer an X-Wing to a TIE fighter. That's uh, who we same are. Same thing with the costumes, I think... A lot of rebel costumes and are scrappy um, and, and well Jedi thought out. costumes are just kind of like Robes. bathrobes <laughs> and a little boring. Whereas I think the over Empire, a plastic white suit. Yes, it's a, it looks it's so that shiny. Offers no stability in Empire <laughs> or in uh, Return of the Jedi when the entire Death Star crew is lined up waiting for well, the Emperor to come through. I know, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It Their is costumes a beautiful are amazing painting. looking yeah, no. and. If like, I and their helmets are cool, I if get I could, it. If I could cosplay, it'd either be like a stormtrooper because I think, I think things like the five hundred first. Um, oh, they do such great work. They, and I think that'd be really fun to dress up as, or even um, I don't have the uh, I don't have the physique for Darth Vader, but I I think that is such a you have a dad bod. Fun you can be Darth Vader. No, I've seen Darth Vader dad bod before yeah, at no. a baseball game, and it's not attractive. No, you're right. It's a little. I sad. want my Darth Vader um, fit and tall. Mm. He's gonna be. He's gonna be a seven feet tall to be that, which is why the Nobody Darth, Vader, can be Darth Vader. The Darth Vader at Disneyland is a tall man. Yeah. I've taken a picture with him. Oh my God! Do you remember when we took Alex to Disneyland and they were very young, and we put them in Darth Vader's arms? And, like, the stormtroopers were, I mean, they were, like, a year and a half old. So the stormtroopers and Darth Vader are just sitting there playing with our kid. And our kid's staring up at them just like, oh, I don't know if I like this. Like, oh, fuck. It's, what a happy memory. Well, now that, well, since you brought up Disneyland, Maggie, um, we have, we had the, uh, the great privilege the of great privilege. being able to live in Southern California for quite a while. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, we don't live there anymore. But while we were there, uh, dozens and dozens of visits to it Disneyland. But However, this was... when we moved, yeah, then they were only like, a, "Oh, only Star Wars!" A, yeah, <laughs> only a few years later, if that, <laughs> they were like, "Guess what? Star Wars Land is being built," and yeah. we're like, "What? This is the we worst timing." We should, should we should go back, right? So Our Maggie, life's better here, but we should go back. I'm gonna hand the the floor to you and oh. just let just talk about how. Well, so we were really lucky to be, to go to and be like big Disney like fans, Disney adults, between like 2004 and 2014, when it was shockingly cheap to go to Disneyland. I mean, as Southern California residents, we were able to get the what they refer to as the Southern California Select Pass, 
um, annual pass where you could only go like 180 days out of the year, which was basically weekdays, never weekends, and no holidays. And it blocked out from like halfway through June until halfway through August because, you know, you could only go when Disneyland would quote unquote be slow. And, um, but those passes cost you $150 for a year. That was it. It was $150 to go to Disneyland for a year, as much as you wanted on weekdays. And since we were close to Anaheim and since we had, first it was when we were friends and dating and then married before children. And then once we had young children who were free to get in after or before two, you know, um, we were able to go to Disneyland a lot and it was a blessed time. And we, we don't take for granted our beautiful memories that we have there, both as a, a couple and as parents with young children. I mean, like we took our son to Disneyland for the first time when he was 11 days old, 11 days old. And when I told like people, like, you know, people would stop us and be like, oh my God, your baby's so small and so cute. I'd be like, oh, thanks. He's 11 days old. Like they'd always go, oh my God, like you must be so proud or not. No, I wasn't pride. It was, they, what did they, they say? I think they said, you're so brave. You're so brave. That was it. And I didn't know if they meant I was brave because I was walking around Disneyland having just given birth or that I was bringing a newborn to Disneyland. But either way, it was fine. Like we just went for the afternoon and Jack stayed in the stroller the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> nobody ever got sick. Nobody, nobody, had... nobody oh, got hurt. Like the baby. Oh God, this is coming to Disneyland. The baby nursing rooms in Disneyland are some of my favorite memories. Anyways, besides all that, we love Disneyland. Um, and going on star tours was always a must. Um, seeing the old, uh, star Wars, like, kid Jedi show that they put on where the kids would come up and like stand up against Darth Vader and be like, no Darth Vader. And Darth would be like, ah, oh, like that. We watch that all the time. Since you bring up star tours real fast. Yeah. Where did you, were, did you ever go to Disneyland before they changed the star tours ride? I did. Cause I can't I remember what year. Don't they remember it. Like I think I, we didn't go to Disneyland a lot as kids. Cause it was, you know, always quote unquote too expensive. Um, once we had adult money and no children, <laughs> it was different. But, um, you know, we never went to Disneyland. So I think that they changed that around, like, the late 90s. So I know I had gone to Disneyland a couple times, but I don't think I remember the ride before it is what it is now. Like, the 3D version of it. Although I did go back when it was Rex as the pilot, if that's what you're asking. Like, yeah, I, I totally... Um, went on it when Rex was the pilot, but they've changed it a couple of times. They have, and yeah. I I went as well when Rex was yeah. the pilot. And then I but went, I you know, afterwards when it became 3PO. I think if, um, I'd have to remind myself, but I, I remember looking up some videos of what the ride looked like mm -hmm. back in the day on YouTube, and I my brain tells me that I remember it. Yeah. It, whether or not my brain's lying to me yeah, is totally to possible, same. but my, I do remember my my you know my parents did take me to Disneyland I think twice mm -hmm. um, during my childhood, and which was you know great and I I have some fond memories of that to this day yeah. that I remember about that trip, um, so it was fun taking our kids yeah, not that to, long ago yeah a couple of years back we were able we went back home to california for a family reunion and we were able to sneak in a one signal a single disney day and disneyland now is a lot more expensive and a lot harder to maneuver and a lot more crowded and so it's still fun and magical but yeah, it's different and but we got to see star wars land and we met up with some local friends who i think a few people recorded my reaction walking from Fantasyland into Batu into Star Wars Land and just sobbing. Um, one of so before pre pandemic, like early twenty twenty, back when we thought that COVID was going to last for six weeks and everything would be fine, Kate Man and I bought tickets to go to Disneyland. We bought a uh, flights to California and we were going to go to Disneyland for my birthday because I wanted to see Star Wars Land. And I kept an image from the uh, Star Wars Facebook page of the Millennium Falcon in, at Disneyland as my phone background. And I told myself I wouldn't change 
that phone background until I got to see that Millennium Falcon in real life. And then three years later, we finally got to see it. And like two years later, whatever, um, seeing the Millennium Falcon in person for the first time, I, I burst into tears and I have no regrets over that. Like I just stood there and I cried at the sight of her and like being in Star Wars land was incredible. It was, it just, you were there. You were, it was realized and yeah, we went into Olga's Cantina and had some drinks. And yeah, we did the rides. And we will talk about uh, Rise of the Resistance because, oh my God, you're in a Star Wars. But for me, the moment that meant the most to me was meeting Chewbacca. <laughs> um, Chewie was out, you know, in front of the Falcon saying hi to fans. And I stood there very diligently and impatiently, but patiently waiting for him to acknowledge me. And he walked over and he like shook our kids, our son's hair, because our son has like long kind of dirty blonde hair. And so he looks like Chewy, and so like Chewy and and our son had this sweet moment where like you know <laughs> they have the same hair and it was really cute and then Chewy turned to me and i was like can i hug you and he held his arms out and i got to hug chewbacca which is every bit as great as you can imagine and then i showed him my princess leia tattoo and i said Chewy, i want to show you something and i showed him my leia tattoo and he sad growled and he put his hand over my tattoo and looked at me and was like, you know, like a sad, chewy growl. And I went, I know, I miss him too. And then I started to cry and he hugged me again. Like, motherfuckers, I got to mourn Princess Leia with Chewbacca. It was one of the most beautiful moments of my entire life. And just proof that Disney magic is so important because, like, I got a chewy hug. We got to have a moment. Nerd. Oh, <laughs> and then later on while we were there uh, caveman was walking around with his gopro kind of filming um batu and uh kylo ren walked past myself and our children with his two <laughs> this two stormtroopers so kylo ren walks past me and i go hey kylo your mother's ashamed of you and he just went uh, um good and then he turned and walked away because he didn't know what else to say to me. <laughs> and we were standing next to two women who started cackling. Uh, and it was just one of my proudest moments. <laughs> is just yelling at Kylo Ren, who's such a little bitch. I remember, <laughs> I remember taking some video of the Millennium Falcon and just uh, playing with my GoPro and like the... The, it was like the sun was kind of yeah, getting it was low, and, and so the light was really pretty. And uh, I just randomly just saw um, Ray walk mm-hmm. by. I was like, "Oh, that's shit, that's Ray!" And so I started videotaping her. And out of nowhere, <laughs> I just see uh, my wife and kids together walk up to her, and I was like, "Oh shit!" And, uh, I'm so glad you have that footage. And that was such to, yeah. a good moment. Uh, my uh, uh, Alex is a big fan, or at least when um, f- uh, Alex when is the a movie, big fan of Ray. Yeah, like, when Alex the movie came out, Alex loves Ray so much. Dressed up as Ray for Halloween. Yeah, one a year. couple of years. I've I've given them Ray hair quite a few times. Like they love, they're in love with Ray. And being and, able to capture a moment with yeah, Ray, they, and, they got to talk and, to each other, and it was so cute. I think Alex floated on that memory for a solid six months. You know, I, I can still bring it up to them and have them go, oh, when, when we talk about that Ray moment. And I'm so glad that Caveman got on camera. It's so sweet. But again, Disney magic, guys, it's so important. Um, on Rise of the Resistance, and if you've been lucky enough to go on that, you know what a fucking trip that ride is. Like, you are in a Star War. It is from... The second you get in the line to the second you walk out, you're in just full Star Wars. And when we went on it for the first time, again, my sweet local friends who had been on this ride a hundred times because they have passes. And thank God for that, too. And thank they God for knew, that, too. Yeah, they they knew, knew how to get around things. And yeah, they really front. navigate. A shout out to Laura and Karen for getting us through Disneyland that Giving day. Us, like uh, an absolute champ. Th- uh, we got the full experience i feel yeah. in uh, in the quickest amount of time because we had to yeah. unfortunately i wish we, I could, wish we have could have spent, spent more time yeah. three days looking through that park and mm-hmm. looking at all the details and because that's one of my favorite things about oh, disneyland yeah. is the details they put into these and the uh, memories lands. That, that you know you revisit like oh that's where this happened or this is where that like oh 
But so anyways, just being yeah. able to to do that, they were a fantastic help. Lauren, with Karen, all I that. love you guys so much. But they took photos of me, again, kind of unbeknownst to me. They took photos and videos of me on the ride, reacting to seeing Poe Dameron's X-wing in person. I burst into tears and cried. Seeing him on the first part of the ride, I burst into tears and cried. Um, walking walking onto that Star Destroyer for the first time in that room filled Chills. with fucking you know stormtroopers. The, this full size uh, Tie Fighters, like my the pictures, I'll, I'll have to post them on our Instagram page when this episode drops. The pictures are so funny because I am just making the stupidest, <laughs> happiest faces because I'm in a Star War, and it's man, they're, they're just some of my purest moments. When we rode the Millennium Falcon ride, I was in the pilot seat and Caveman was the co pilot or, or the gunner or whatever. But he, I was the one that was able to pull the ship into light speed and you get to do it twice. So I did it the first time and right before the second time, um, cause you did it twice on, on the ride. I said to him, do you want to do it? And so he, in the look on his face, like he was so Like a giddy little child. I was like, yeah, I want to go to light speed. And pull it to go to light speed. We did not get to spend enough time in the Millennium Falcon, like outer room, but we have pictures of like, of caveman and I sitting at the table with the game, like just, the biggest smiles just like ah, and as as, as much as my kids i'm sure were having a fun time with all of this yeah. just being in disneyland in general for us it was, we we were God, the, it was it's funny to have the adults be the ones who are having more fun oh you know in a man, in a, an area yeah it was it was totally we spent a lot are. of time there um for just the joy of it we met um alex and i met fennec shand who you know god damn it she was so beautiful she could have punched me in the throat and like she i asked if we could get a picture with her and she made me go and like take a a job of the hut um like stuffed toy and like move it out of her sight and that was the the task that i had to do and so i was like okay like whatever you say fetting shan like choke me mommy it's fine and so i walked over and i picked up the wrong stuffed toy and i turned and looked at her and she like wagged her finger at me as in a no no way Whew. Just, that was a moment for me, myself, and I. And I, that was a good one. I'm surprised I didn't buy the Poe Dameron uh, Black One um, X-Wing helmet. But I think at that point, I was, like, there were other souvenirs that I was, was determined just so to get. Much. There was um, just so much. We could, of course. Yeah, you, you can't. It was such an expensive day, but God, was it worth it. We had such, we were there for over 12 hours. I think we were there from yeah. like 11 to 1. And by the time we left that park, we were so exhausted. But it was the, just the best day. And most of that was because of, man, we got to be in a Star War. It was so cool. So cool. They may not be my favorite mm -hmm. by a long shot. But the prequels exist. Yeah. They've got some great things. We've seen them. And some terrible things. And, uh, yeah, so next, uh, we're going to talk about, <laughs> no. just how hot Ewan McGregor is as Obi-Wan Kenobi. There, <laughs> you know what? A lot of people shit on the Kenobi show and I don't know why, because it gave me baby Leia who broke me in a thousand different pieces and it gave us Hayden Christensen again, like doing a great job. And I don't know. I loved it. I, I thought it was great. I thought it was, it's not the best Star Wars show because that's Andor. Andor. Oh my god. Andor, Andor is the best show. Let's Andor talk about Andor. Is, oh, some of the best. I can't wait to rewatch it. We need to as soon as we're done with Brooklyn Nine Nine, we should rewatch Andor. <laughs> um that I think show I watched the first two episodes. Every sure. single episode was like a solid panic attack. It was so tense Each, and so gripping. Each three episodes the was little, a little arcs beginning, that they middle, told. and arc on like first task, do this. Then three episodes of this overarching oh my God, story the prison of scene getting the sequence the i mean the yeah the prison scene was so intense yes the the heist the heist, the heist yeah, on that, so that planet with the big moon stars anxiety <laughs> heightening and every character that we met for one or two moments was played so well like that andor show is a masterpiece of star wars 
um, leading up to what should have been the first F-bomb in Star Wars. Well, not technically. I believe that it's been put on record that R2 and, and BB-8 swear like pirates. <laughs> but when Andor's adopted mom is speaking out at the hologram at her own funeral, is she? you can see her mouth at she, what you hear is fight the Empire, but what she says is fuck the Empire. And then a huge riot starts and a bunch of Empire goons get murdered. Like, it's amazing. Um, and then Andy Serkis, motherfucking Andy Serkis, just the king as the, as the prison guy, helping them, helping the people of that prison escape. Like, in the speech that he gave, oh my god, Andor is the, so The speeches good. in this movie, the, Series. the one that... Um... Skarsgård gives. Oh my um, god, I forgot about Skarsgård. He's so fucking good in that. That Empire, like, just douchey accountant oh dude gosh. that had bigger aspirations for his himself mother. and his mother. Oh, and his whole relationship that he had with Deidre, the, like, the woman from the Empire who was just so ruthless and. Yeah. Like their weird romance, like what the fuck was any of that? It I was cannot so wait till season two. Good, I cannot wait for season. two. I had two. more fun. I love the Mandalorian. Oh God, we're but, gonna talk about but the Endor. The Yodito in here I in a think moment. I'm looking forward more to Endor season. Or I'm, I keep on saying Endor. It's not the Endor. Andor. Yeah. Um, the man, not the planet. <laughs> it is a little tricky. Fucking Star Wars names, guys. Ugh. Like, I got a numb tongue. <laughs> Nam tang. Hey, Star Wars reference. <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> Nam tang. Nam tang is from Star Trek. No, it's not Star Wars. No, it's, it's from Star Trek. It's when Chris Pine gets injected. You're right. <laughs> no, you're right. But I'm thinking specifically of um of uh, nine num. No, no, no. I'm thinking oh. of um when Jar Jar gets his mouth in the. Um, oh God damn it! In the. Uh, yes, the pod racer, mm -hmm, the pod racer engine, engine, uh -huh, and, and gets his... shocked by it, mm -hmm. and his tongue goes numb, and he's pointing at his <laughs> mouth saying "nam tang, nam tang." I was thinking. I know you're thinking. I was thinking of "nam tang" <laughs> yeah, from, from Star Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> JJ, both, and then JJ Abrams did a Star Abrams. Wars. It's all connected. It's all connected. Please, oh my god! Please keep that in its entirety. <laughs> Ooh, all right. This is the most fun. See, this is why I knew that this would be fun just coming in cold and hot because this is what it's like to talk between the two of us. You know, we'll be watching a movie and we'll pause it because we have a thought. Actually, we'll spend the last 10 minutes of the movie talking about our thought until one of us decides to pause the TV. And then we go into like a 45 minute conversation about the stupidest shit, and it's so much fun. And sometimes, uh, even during the our regular podcast episodes that we do, oh my god, uh, when we're just supposed to be writing notes and not really talking to yeah. each other because we want to save that for our conversation, we, we can't to... help it. We like just or, something uh, like, will pop out, be like, you know, oh, I got to remember to talk about this, or or for me, it's I say me saying it. things to him that I know I can't say on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of the mandalorian uh mando and the yodito my beloveds i will never forget again i think it was that same christmas with my mom it could have been the following christmas when disney plus premiered i believe it was christmas day and the mandalorian like it was when like yeah, like Christmas Day, or around then. Anyways, The Mandalorian dropped, and we watched it, like, Christmas afternoon. My mom's caveman and I on the couch together. Enjoying The Mandalorian. You know, he's a bounty hunter. He can freeze people in carbonite. He's got that cool-ass ship. Like, he goes to this weird planet for reasons. Like, there's a robot by Taika Waititi. Like, all of this is tracking. I'm enjoying all of this. Like, I'm settling in for, you know new star wars and loving the hell out of it and then we saw the baby yoda and all three of us just yelled oh my god at that sweet sweet little boy soft tiny little man who we have all come to know and love as sure i guess grogu but he is and will always be the baby yoda there aren't many surprises anymore. No, with anything, television or movies, it, 
it yeah. inevitably gets released. I or mean, you hear something. There's or... something that I just saw recently from uh, uh, Daredevil Reborn. I'm yeah. not going to say it here, but it was know, leaked it's, by. It's just a it it was leaked, leaked by image set that I that then they had to turn out and I be like, oh yeah, it's real. I didn't. Uh, look for it but just because it gets uh yeah it, it, became a, it had to become official because it, just, it got leaked and which is disappointing so the fact that this was kept yeah. such a good secret and because it was such a fun surprise not knowing wait a minute is this uh a prequel yeah or is, is that this, is that yoda yeah, is that yoda what, or is that is a, a yoda creature because we've, we've never, never seen, seen well, one we, we saw yaddle except for yaddle but Oof. um which Although, uh, yeah, no, you made me watch the Yaddle Tales of the Jedi. Yeah, if, any, if you guys out there haven't seen, heart. yeah, if you want to see more Yaddle, <laughs> if you're... Like, if, if you're into some Yaddle... If you're into some Yaddle... I feel like if they're into some Yaddle, that's they why probably they're listening already seen to this it. podcast. <laughs> and they've already seen it. Like, I don't they're think, like, yeah, we've watched for I don't think Jedi there's guy. any diehard Yaddle fans out there that haven't seen <laughs> Diehard Yaddle. I got, my Cuts next tattoo is going to be a Yaddle tattoo. <laughs> I mean... But I will get you it. I will get you it next month if you. Yaddle your... was badass. <laughs> I will get you a Yaddle tattoo. Yaddle I was swear to God. badass. No, but so you know, here comes the baby Yoda, just the cutest, and like he's eating frogs, and he can use the Force. Like, oh my God, you know, and he's just sweet, sweet boy. But it was also like they made me love the fucking Jawas. Because in that second episode where uh, Mando and and Baby Yoda have got to go get the egg from the Mudhorn in order to get the ship back, like the fucking Jawas stripped his ship and the only way he could get it back was if he went and got that egg from that giant Mudhorn, right? Like that whole just silly little misadventure that they go on is some of my favorite shit. Because you see the Jawas fighting Mando, you see the Jawas just like chilling with him, him sitting in the cockpit of their, you know, giant rolling machine, their giant rolling ship. Like, and he's just all scrunched up and they're all shit like that shit like that. Just those beautiful little moments made me so happy. This was also, this was also the first time in any kind of star Wars, uh, at least visual media, like lore where they show, uh, the uh, Tusken Raiders in a positive light. Yeah. Oh my God. And even more so than in Boba Fett or book of Boba Fett. But, They but it started gave, in Mandalorian. The, so they called them the Sand People, but they're the Tusken Raiders. They're the indigenous inhabitants of that planet that got, you know, massacred and settled away and sent away. Like they communicate through like colonizers of, make fucking indigenous people do. They, like they communicate in a form of uh, sign, language. sign language. Yeah, like just that you got to see their culture you got to fall in love with them like my god like thank you star wars for that for redeeming an indigenous population and giving them a story and a voice like that's just kind of beautiful man there are certain star wars stories where you're like was that really necessary did i really need to know this but i really liked getting that extra bit of um humanity yeah, i guess you could say out of the tuscan raider instead of them that just you'd never seen before making them like the stereotypical like you know native american native americans that keeps out. attacking yeah. and we need to protect ourselves from this yeah making Essentially, them the bad guys they were always kind of you know they kind of reminded me of fireflies uh reavers yeah where they're just like these yeah they're just ruthless ruthless terrible like they will just completely do. yeah they'll kill your whole family i mean what they did to anakin's mother yeah and then what he did to them you know that that's always been Even the that's always been like this big yeah um cowboys and indians kind thing. of uh like, demonizing yeah. the tuscan raider through that scene but it was nice to get something like this yeah. and even more so like we said in the book of boba fett which did even more it did some Tuscan beautiful Raider. things for the Tuscan Raiders. It made me probably my favorite. I know we're skipping from Mandalorian to the Book of Boba Fett. That's but all right. They're the same show. I think uh, the, it is the same show. It's true. What was the best episode of the Book of Boba Fett? The, uh, the Mandalorian, Mandalorian episode. Yeah. yeah, and it was essentially the Mandalorian part, uh, season two part B. Yeah, it was two point um, five. Yeah, two point five, two point season two part two. Yeah. However you want to put it, it wasn't really about Boba Fett. No, which is both upsetting upsetting but i still had fun yeah like it was still a fun show to watch 
other than it made me the, like Boba Fett. Uh, other than the modders, or whatever they're called. Literally, the same episode gave me some of my favorite Star Wars and some of my least favorite Star Wars, the book of Boba Fett. But, um, the, but anyway, so the Tusk, going back to the Tusken Raiders. Yeah, the... It's um, beautiful, man. The fact that they gave these people a proper indigenous story and showed how the colonialism of, of uh, Tatooine messed up the indigenous life. I like that that story got told. Going back to Mando and the Yodito, uh, the third episode, we're not going to go this by this episode episode, I promise, <laughs> but I just very vividly remember like a lot of the joy from the Mandalorian from those first three because we got like this great sort of you know space western which turned into this really funny like buddy cop road trip adventure which then turned into the Batman when Mando gives the baby over to Werner Herzog I want to see the baby and uh, the and then decides to go full on fucking Batman and get his kid back. Although he murdered a lot of people, but by Batman I mean just the way he was able to like disappear and reappear and like smoke bombs and shit. Like, yeah, Mando, uh, Mando definitely became a ninja. Fucking that that shootout, that attempt to escape that town was so goddamn good from beginning to end, and I just remember sitting there with my husband watching this fucking incredible Star Wars and looking at him and just us both just being so happy and excited and just loving it, you know? And that's that's why to me like those first three episodes are really dear to me is because of the like the reactions I got to share with you when we watched them. Um same with season two, episode one, sitting on the bed in a hotel in Port Townsend for my birthday watching season two episode one and like falling in love with fucking Cobb Vanth because they put Timothy Oliphant in Star Wars and we lost our fucking minds as huge fans of that man we lost our minds that he was in Star Wars and then the whole like scene with the Tuscans and the and crate dragon the crate dragon and then at the end you get your first glimpse of Boba Fett like we just sat there watching that you know in the hotel room on vacation just like dying with joy and it just made, like, the whole day better. Like, we watched that, and then we went out and had just the best day out and about together. And, like, so that's the shit that, like, I love The Mandalorian for what it is, but I love that. It's the same way that I'm always going to remember going to see that Ahsoka episode with you, you know, in the theater. Because we were lucky enough to be near one of the theaters that was showing it, and we got tickets to it. Um, so being able to go see, like, this that incredible episode of Ahsoka where she goes back into her memories with um, Anakin... Like, seeing that on the big screen was really fucking cool. So, you know, it's again, it's here it is, reliving life's memories with my favorite person over these stories. And it's beautiful. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I go on rants, but that's because I'm so passionate about these things. And my memories with you. Like, these are memories I share with you. And so I will always hold those things very dear to my heart. So I know we give the prequels a little bit of a hard time. We give it some shit. I mean, I think collectively, they're doing a lot to redeem themselves, but collectively we all give the sequels some shit. We do. Our generation does. A child of the 90s, uh, early 2000s, growing up with the prequels series. As their Star Wars. As their Star Wars. I know that they appreciate it a lot more, which is why they're probably into the animated series because i'm i think yeah the animation is weird yeah the stories don't always uh, i'm not always i don't always want to be watch have to watch an episode of jar jar binks and c3po go off and do a whole episode by themselves it's just not entertaining yeah guys let's be real honest they put there are some rough pairings in the clone wars that make you go how much time do I have to get? Like, do I really have to watch this? That might be one of the reasons why I, the animated series doesn't grab on to me so much is because the prequel trilogy didn't. Yeah, uh, it was they they weren't didn't our do Star it for Wars. me. Yeah, um, we were you know, older. Pod we, racing yeah. was kind of cool. I mean, the duel of fates scene. Duel of fates is so hard. Still... You take out all of Anakin and the ship. Like, just just completely delete Anakin going up to destroy. That giant uh, imperial or uh, you know alien spaceship above 
I get it. Yeah. Um, Take out all of Anakin's parts. Yeah, all of Anakin's stuff. Just take that out. And just watch the Duel of Fates. Yeah, from, like, fucking that. And the From end of the fan- of uh, episode one is so fucking good. The lightsaber threesome. Yes. And every- yeah, everything with um, Padme, <laughs> Panda Bear. <laughs> Panda Bear. <laughs> one, of, um, one of our favorite Star Wars spoofs is the robot chicken one where uh, you see... Palpatine get the phone call from Darth Vader saying that the Death Star has exploded. And if you've never seen that, you it's like four minutes long. Go watch it. It's hysterical. It's probably on YouTube. But we quote it nonstop in our lives together. Like us saying, go for Papa Palpatine. What the hell's an aluminum falcon? Your feet must smell like leathery burnt bacon. Like these are things that we say to each other on a pretty weekly basis. Um, and it's just become a part of our vocabulary. <laughs> so if you hear us refer to, um, all this to say, if you hear us refer to him as Papa Palpatine or Panda Bear for, uh, Padme, like it's, it's more comfortable for me to say Panda Bear to Caveman and have him know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like, what's her name again? Uh, oh, Padme. Panda Bear. Pan, yeah. Padme. Padme. <laughs> um, what's Palpatine? The Phantom Menace is almost unwatchable at this point for me. And if I'm going to watch... Or if I want to know anything about The Phantom Menace, I'll just listen to Weird Al's The Saga Begins because it's like the perfect length of that story. Attack of the Clones, I enjoy I as bad as the dialogue is. And the dialogue is who riff. It's very rough. It's and riff. like I, while I was editing the Spider-Man episode, I could hear a lot of the dialogue coming yeah. from my phone. And, and it's, sometimes it's, I just look at Hayden Christensen and I'm like, Dude, really? Oh, that was like, what oof. you did? And George saying, looking at George Lucas. And yeah, George like, Lucas was like, home, you didn't want to girl. do one more shot? No, not like, one, try another one more take. time. There was not one person on that set that said, we should do another. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. Not like here. Here everything is soft and smooth. But I still enjoy the story. And then I haven't seen Revenge of the Sith as much but it's also a pretty solid fucking film it's, like it's, it's probably my good, favorite of the but because it's so dark i'd rather watch attack of the clowns it's my favorite of the trilogy mainly because i really like the opening sequence of the it's a little bit of a dog fight in space mm-hmm. and then they gotta crash land yeah a big ship um on coruscant like that shit's hella cool it was a really cool sequence i thought it was shot well um and I can't say that about much other prequel movies, yeah. how well they're shot. This one oh. is darker. It's lit darker. The character is getting darker. Um, it also, it's a there's little There's a lot of rough. whining between the characters. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a like Harry Potter's because, worst part oh of God. his childhood. The part that I like least about, the, the part that I struggle heavily with in Attack of the Clones is the loss of agency that pa- Panda Bear, Padme... <laughs> has like she is just all about Anakin like it's just she is no longer really a political figure like like her whole agency just becomes kind of like being the damsel in distress for Anakin and she it's leaned into heavily like you know she's, she's running around fu- like f- apparently fully pregnant with twins in that tiny little body which attack of the clones sorry I, I mean Revenge of the Sith yeah, yeah. Not sober, guys. I apologize. You know what I'm talking about. We're all fans here. Episode three. Episode three. Yes. Um, no, she is no longer a political figure. Yeah, she's no she's longer... lost all agency, but just to be like kind of the dumb wife that's always in danger. And I struggle with that because Padme is such a strong character. Her character was so strong and, in the first two. Movies. You know, in some of the books that they've made about her and the stories that they've told about her, you know, there's some beautiful, there's some beautiful shit in the comics. Yeah, seeing her just be this sort of like annoying trophy wife who's then murdered by her husband and is able to give birth to the twins but then give her life force over to Anakin? I still don't know what the hell happened there. She died of a broken heart. Yeah, which is... I mean, she died because her husband force choked her. Yeah, like... like It's it's just so fucking dumb and I really struggle with it. Like, so uh, seeing Anakin turn into Darth Vader is really fucking cool. Seeing the Ewoks and Yoda, that Yoda fight's hella fucking cool of um, Yoda and the Senate. Ewoks. No, um, I keep bringing up Ewoks. I meant to say the Wookiees. Yes. The Wookiees. Like Guys, I'm not sober. 
<laughs> that was the whole point of this conversation is like we're not going to be sober for it so let's just ha have fun doing it we are having fun and i am having fun so just bear please forgive me episode three is hella cool but i really have struggled with panda so i just I, I don't watch it as much i prefer attack of the clones she is better in attack of the clones like at least she kicks some ass yeah, uh, a couple in, of times. in the first movie, she's more of a political leader. Well, in the yeah, second movie, she your, yeah. In the second movie, she is also still a political leader, but she gets to be an action hero too. Mm -hmm. And she then gets to have some cool shit. And she gets then to be a little in princess the third Leia. one, you know, now she's pregnant, and now she's um, concerned for her husband and <laughs> what, and his bad dreams. And there's that tweet or tumblr post out there and i'm paraphrasing this uh, where it's like you know the reality is that uh padme would have been waddling out you know nine months <laughs> nine months pregnant with twins waddling out of that ship like anakin what the fuck are you doing <laughs> you know yeah, she was instead very of, polite instead of her being like oh what are you, oh anakin you're breaking my heart you're going down a path I can't follow. If you've ever done a pregnant woman, especially a woman pregnant with twins, she would have been like, get the fuck back in here. I'm not dealing with this right now. Obi-Wan, you shut that shit down. Throw her sandal at you. <laughs> she would have been pissed. So, I don't know. Like, uh, the prequels are I, you worth know, it for some things and they're not worth it for a lot of things. They're, but they're, they're still there and they're still fun. They're not for us. No, and fucking, you know, they, weren't, is they probably weren't even made for us. Like, we, we are that generation just like, you know, we there's all this shit that always gets um, uh, thrown at the new Ghostbusters movies. Um, oh yeah, and my, God, my brother hates the new Ghostbusters movies, which is fine. Passion. He doesn't have to watch them, no. and nobody's forcing him to. And he still has yeah. the ones from the '80s to enjoy. But our son loves our the son new Ghostbusters. Fucking loves the new Ghostbusters and so, so much. We we and he loves uh, Godzilla and Kong, and so we're taking him to see these movies and see, and and. and they're the, fun. That's who the studios are making these movies yeah. for, is a younger generation. Yeah. It's and not our... it's the same thing with the prequels. It was made for... I don't think George Lucas made those movies for the young guys no. that went into the theater in 1977. I mean, he kind of did, but he was making it for... He was trying to get that new fan base. But he want, that's the problem. And yeah. they were expecting another, you know, not so much blue screen that you yeah. know, the entire set and the behind the scenes of those yeah. movies is just blue screen on blue screen yeah. while they're writing on a thing that's made out of blue screen. Yeah, it's and it's the anime the the CG's rough. I uh, don't blame these actors sometimes with some of their poor acting because there's nothing to act it's against. It's the best they could do. You know, they but have Ewan McGregor still fucking killed it. Ewan McGregor was the best part of that. And Liam Neeson in the first one is amazing. No, he's incredible. Uh, he's one he it's one of my favorite of characters Obi Liam Neeson's ever played. Yeah. Qui-Gon is amazing. Qui-Gon Jinn's an amazing uh, character. Yeah. And He's like, probably my favorite character of the entire prequel trilogy. No, mine's Obi-Wan, but Qui-Gon's like solid second. Um, you know, since we've been sitting here passionately talking about the sequels, or the prequels, we should passionately talk about the sequels. So I brought up the fact that I absolutely love The Force Awakens and the hope that I felt at the end of that movie about where this story could go. Like I wrote a, I wrote a complete, it's not a great, it's great up until the end, but I wrote a great Storm Pilot fan fiction after watching The Force Awakens that nobody's ever read except for a few of my friends. It was so much fun to do that. And it was so much fun to like live in the hope of where this story is going to go. And then we got uh, The Last Jedi. And look. First of all. It's my least... <laughs> Uh, let me finish. It's my least favorite of the sequels. It has some great moments. It has some really incredible things that I will passionately, I will p passionately defend. Not that anybody's picking it apart, but forever the scene where Luke and Leia have that little moment before he goes out to face Kylo Ren and she knows that he's just a projection, but they still have a moment. And that's the last time we ever get to see Luke and Leia on screen together. And we can see Mark and Carrie on screen together. And as you can tell, like, it makes me so emotional thinking about it. Because we lost her so soon afterwards. And so that final scene for Leia and Luke is so beautiful. <laughs> it's so fucking beautiful. But The Last Jedi is such a rough watch. And it... 
I just wish, I wish somebody would have gone and said like, Hey guys, what are you doing? Like, what are your three scripts about? Because we need to get them on the same page. It was like they let, they let JJ go off and do his own thing. And they were like, Ryan Johnson, go off and do your own thing. It does not. All you need is the same characters. Nothing else matters. Instead of being like, no, here's the story that we want to tell from beginning to end. Like Lawrence Kasdan could have fucking sat down and been like, here's the story from beginning to end with JJ Abrams, with Ryan Johnson. They could have all figured it out. Right. But they didn't. And then Ryan Johnson went off and did his own fucking thing. And it ruined a bunch of stuff. And then, so then the third one, which thank God that was never made because I read that script. It was a piece of shit. And not just because they tried to make Poe and Ray fall in love with each other. But they... you Yeah. Mm-hmm. I know. Why? They were really trying to make you think that Poe Dameron was, was straight. And well, it's not even that. Like, I don't think nope. yeah, Poe and Ray yeah. ever had a connection... Mm-hmm. Even in, from uh, Force they, Awakens' they, point of view, they never, they don't. Meet. If anything, you could have Finn and Ray, but yeah. not Poe. No, <laughs> like, they, like, they don't makes, even meet until the end of the last makes Jedi. Absolutely anyways. no sense. Wow, maybe we did dodge an even bigger. bullet. We dodged the biggest fucking bullet, guys. And so then JJ had uh, had to come along and be like, we, we need to, we need to lasso this and bring it back. But too much time was spent on that than giving it a satisfying ending, which is how we got. Somehow Palpatine returned. Somehow Palpatine returned. You can tell I'm passionate about these stories. And, and they're not, I like, having seen, I've only seen The Rise of Skywalker, like, four times, maybe? Three times, maybe? That is not a movie I've rewatched a lot. Um, because... The second one? No, the, the Rise, I'm talking about The Rise of Skywalker, no. I haven't seen The Rise of Skywalker as much, because I don't... What was the second one called? The Last Jedi. Last. Yeah, Rise. which... Again, it should have been. Stop using "rise" in your titles. Yeah, it should have. It should have gone like the title-wise. It should have gone "The Force Awakens," "The Rise of Skywalker," "The Last Jedi." Like "The yeah. Last Jedi" is a better fitting name, but it's the same way that you can like switch around, you know, all the Star Wars names to fit the movies better than the movies that they're actually on. That's a whole big thing too. Um, <laughs> but so all this to say, I I apologize for the sequels. I love the sequels because they gave me Poe and Finn, and Ray and Ben Solo, who is such a sweet boy who deserves all the hugs and kisses in this world. Not Kylo Ren, Ben Solo. But they also should have never redeemed Ben Solo, or uh, Kylo Ren, because Kylo Ren's Matt the Radar Technician, and he's a little bitch. Like, that, by the way, again, Saturday Night Live, undercover boss on Starkiller Base, the funniest thing I've ever seen, that I quote to myself way too often. A buddy of mine saw Kylo Ren take his shirt off in the shower and, and he said that Kylo Ren had an eight pack. What? Your friend's a liar, man. Kylo Ren is a punk bitch. That guy looks like he weighs 30 pounds soaking wet underneath that little black dress. Also, and I'm not going to get oh, into boy. it, I promise. Yeah, nope. Caveman's a little worried here. Uh, Kylo and Ray are cousins, so them getting together is gross. And that's all I'm going to say about that. That could be a 45 minute conversation. Uh, okay. Anyway. What do you think about the sequels, Caveman? So, after after I watched The Force Awakens, I really I really enjoyed my time. It didn't give me any anything, you know. It was it's completely different from the prequels. It's completely different. Well, I mean, from it is just kind original. of a new hope again, but right. And that, but that's I'm, not even, I'm fine that's with not that. Even what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's more like the the style the the way it looks the because it's a more modern film it just has a different this whole another look to it it's kind of more real it's cleaner and seeing you know the new stormtrooper outfits so um cool. you know it, it's just but everything from i guess everything that i had been shown from before just kind of was now gone not, I'm not saying I'm not going to be they as were dramatic. So similar, I'm not though. going to be as dramatic as saying that the sequels killed off my childhood because I'm not going <laughs> down you know that. I'd I'm not going down that road. It's a stupid law because I get upset at people who yeah. say that. Um, because it's it's dumb. Yeah, that's because bullshit. You're, like, you're, no, it didn't. Yeah, <laughs> just, but but they were kind of being like, all right, everything from the past really doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Um, we're doing our own thing now. But we're still going to include these characters from the past. Yeah. And, but they kind of, I don't, I, it's unfortunate, but they really did kind of make these characters go against type. 
against yeah, no. with their characters. Like I get it. They I think took him. Han Solo just no. What didn't do it for me? I think the only I think the only character, and this includes uh, Luke Skywalker, uh, but the only character that kind of stays with who they've always been was Chewie and Leia. Yeah. And everybody else seemed to be a different they person. Made, but let's I'm be not... real fair here, really quick. Uh, Luke Skywalker was always a whiny little bitch, and I refuse to believe that he did not grow up to be a whiny little bitch, <laughs> but old. I'm sorry. I Han, yes, I think that they kind of, like, it is unfortunate what they did to Han Solo's character. He could have been more. I, I get that Harrison Ford was like, I will only come back if you kill me off. I understand that. And I don't have a problem with Han no. Solo being killed off. Yeah, his the fact that he was a little more, like, I don't know, like, dopey like he had lost his spirit but he also had lost his wife and his kid but did he necessarily need that tragic of a backstory is kind of what like was it necessary to give him that backstory is my point of view there i refuse to believe that luke skywalker that whole whiny little bitch <laughs> grew up to be anything other but a whiny old bitch i'm just saying i love my over dramatic queen another thing about the sequel trilogy is i guess when i first heard that jj J. abrams was doing the first movie, I guess I missed the memo that they sent out that he wasn't doing the next one right after. At least from the I, moment I, when I first heard about him getting I, the job, yeah. I figured, okay, he's going to do all three. Yeah. I, th- I guess I just assumed that they'd want... Because well, uh, we, knew, we knew they were going to do three movies. I think they released that J.J. Abrams was only going to do the first one. Because I think a lot of people were like, oh, what? Well, he can't stick the landing, which I'm sorry, J.J. Abrams, but you've had trouble sticking the landing a couple times. Love you, but homegirl. But he um, he made the best one out of the three. He made the best out of the three, but that's because they didn't. That's going back to my whole point of like, they nobody sat down and said, here's the story we want to tell from beginning to end. Movie one's about this. Movie two's about this. Movie three resolves it and is this. They never did that. They let them write. Like, they let Ryan Johnson do what they wanted. That's where they failed. Is it wasn't Lawrence Kasdan that wrote it. It was Ryan Johnson that wrote it. And nobody in the studio took a step back and went, this doesn't fit into, like, what story are you trying to tell? And then the other guy who was supposed to do it, whose name I don't even remember, um, and I don't care to look up, that's just how it is. The third guy was then going to have to come in and, like, tie up all the loose ends, and the way they did it made Catherine Kennedy go, what the fuck, no. We can't do that. And so then they begged J.J. Abrams to come back because everybody hated The Last Jedi. Everybody hated The Last Jedi. It came out, and collectively, the world went, what What the fuck was that? So, And it wasn't even really Ryan Johnson's fault. No, because but he it was, was. But he was given free reign to make a Star Wars movie yeah. however he wanted, because he wasn't told what, what yeah, was happening before, and he wasn't being told what was happening no, after. No, they were just like, go make your own Star Wars movie, and, and he we'll did. loop it in and somehow. And it's a fine, to me, it is a fine standalone Star Wars movie, if you don't connect it to anything that came before yeah. or want it to connect to anything after. Speaking of like, murdering that's, that's, characters, he completely changed Poe Dameron's character from this good, because, noble man to kind of an asshole and a bit of a stereotype. Because, like I said, n- there's nothing before it and nothing after it. So he, yeah. Which is why it's it's an okay movie And then that whole fucking weird itself. romance with Kylo and Rey, like, ugh, you're cousins. But in the end, it was not a good movie. It's essentially... So many connections have been made from the mo- the moment the movie starts and ends that you can pinpoint to every beat to Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. It's yeah. essentially Empire Strikes Back Part 2 with different but, characters. No, everybody bitched about The, same the Force Awakens line. being A New Hope. But then, and everybody was like, oh, well, The Last Jedi is so different from Empire. And it's like, no, it's not, motherfuckers. It's the same movie. But yeah, again, it literally uh, you literally heard me cry a moment ago talking about it so it exists and i have to just i have to deal with the fact that that movie exists and if i rewatch it i'm gonna watch the parts I, that i really like and i might fast i do want to rewatch others i would like to go back um sometime and rewatch all three of the uh sequel movies um obviously you and i have watched force awakens dozens of times uh it is a really fun comfort show or i should say comfort movie um it's it's a great watch it's, it's just an easy it's feel watch. good it's easy it's it's adventurous it's the most um, hopeful of the three I, 
every, yeah, and the things you don't uh, know really don't matter by the end of it. Um, however, I, w I do want to watch parts uh, eight and nine again. Nine definitely have not watched that no, more. No, I haven't watched it enough. More than twice, mm -hmm. all the way through. I may have tried to start watching it again, either fell asleep or yeah. just. I've watched a lot off. of my favorite scenes. Like I've fast forwarded just to like watch the Poe and Finn scenes in that movie because they're those two are so in love and they're such husbands. So say what you will about those sequel that sequel trilogy, but by far my favorite movie that has been made since Disney bought Lucasfilm was Rogue One. Rogue One, Rogue One is a perfect movie. Is a perfect Star Wars movie it's, it's from the best beginning Star to Wars end. Film. It's so much fun to watch. All the characters are great. Some wonderful actors. It birthed the series Andor. Alan Tudyk as K2SO. Fucking K2SO is the most perfect droid. To uh, The droids have gotten delightfully sassier and sassier, which I love. The droid from Solo was a ton of fun. Uh, the little guy in Andor, the little like square robot droid, he was just precious boy but fucking k2so is my favorite star wars droid he is the only one that you could actually see like just being like who the fuck do you think you are like saying that to a human being would be amazing and 100 percent k2 um that character is perfection donnie yen oh was... my god Jared enway my baby I love Donnie Yen just as an actor. Oh, he's um, so perfect. The he's boy. <laughs> uh, when when I found out that Donnie Yen was going to be in Rogue One, it I was so happy about it. I I don't think Maggie has watched Ip Man. I haven't no, but I have always wanted to. Uh, I think you'd dig it, especially because uh, he is such a force to be reckoned with and an amazing actor. An amazing choreograph, um, martial artist, and uh, he was his when I same thing when I found out that he was going to be in the latest John Wick movie. It, it just adds that extra bit of oh my god! I can't wait to see him just kick you some know that, ass. Yeah, you know, that you know, yeah, you you know you're in for a good time when when he's um, going to be in a movie, and his character is amazing. It, it, like to be somebody who has so much faith in the force mm -hmm. but can't, the force the but force can't use me. the force i know um other than it may help him with the way he sees quotes <laughs> it sees things since he is a blind man in the, uh rogue one his hetero life partner Baze malbus Baze malbus yeah played by uh wen jang who unfortunately i have never seen him in yeah i know nothing else. about him but he was so good in i this. really like his character in this um really great supporting yeah Baze, character too Baze and Chirrut are Chirrut, yeah yeah two more space husbands that i just i could die for like i i just i love those I mean, two <laughs> so much you almost shot me you're welcome ben mendelson mads ben mickelson so fucking good mads mickelson fucking forrest whitaker forrest whitaker like like god damn forrest whitaker as Saw Gerrera is so fucking good in this movie. And then, like, I know that he's a character that was... I think he's from the cartoons. I think he started out there. So people seeing him live action for the first time, I think, was a big thing. Um, but he was so fucking good in this movie. Uh, even Felicity Jones, who, I don't know, I kind of... Nothing her, like... I don't. I haven't seen a lot of. Stuff I can't with her say I've her, seen yeah. a lot of her stuff. She's fine. She's adorable, but she's. I mean, I love her Jen in this. Urso yeah, is Jen is a, a fantastic, incredible fucking character. Especially for Star Wars, Diego Luna, of, um, of course. Uh, <laughs> it's Cassian. Oh, I'm trying to remember the f Diego Luna. I'm trying to remember the movie that he was in that I. Um, and for me, it was Dirty Dancing, Havana Nights. Really. Uh huh. <laughs> 100% that was the first time I saw Diego Luna and I went oh yeah hello sir first, uh, I, I just remember I think he had a nude scene yeah um, was it uh, E.T. Mama Tabian uh, Tabian uh, I took German in high school guys so. maybe yeah. Um, well we haven't talked about well, Riz Ahmed who plays Bodhi who 
love Riz Ahmed. Oh my god, I love him so so much. Amazing actor. I loved Bodhi deserved the world. He deserved so much more. He was such a strong, soft boy. And... On on HBO, if you haven't seen it, there's a mini series called The Night of, and Riz Ahmed is amazing in that that mini series. Um, just a plus plus acting like yeah he's incredible he's a amazing. great rapper too he yeah uh the sweatshop boys mm-hmm. is um his hip-hop group he also uh, did from, that song of, on the hamilton mixtape yeah and got a great <laughs> mixtape song uh, a lot of people kind of have some issues with uh the the use of cg to bring back governor tarkin and a young princess leia um this is the uh, first time they ever did this for um for Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah. Not and Disney. Didn't... Disney has done this before. Um, they Their first uh, kind of practice run uh, movie was uh, Tron Legacy. Well, yeah, but, but that was just de-aging them. It wasn't like bringing, bringing them their back. faces. Yeah, I know, but it, it was like it, it was one of those. It's based off of the same kind of technology, what's, though. What's it called? That face swapping technology, everybody got deep fake is what it eventually became. But this was Um, made before deep fake. Yeah, but it's but it was kind of that same idea of placing another person's face. uh, (laughs) Lit the fire fire that caused (laughs) deep face and gave us young Luke Skywalker later. And it all comes back to Poe. I you know what again I didn't mind fucking young Luke Skywalker because when he f- showed up at the end of the Mandalorian I cried so hard I couldn't walk for a few minutes like that the end of that episode where he lets he takes his helmet off and lets the Odito go with a baby drama queen Luke Skywalker uh you know silly little bitch Luke Skywalker he <laughs> I cried my heart out I'm not sorry I the music was beautiful man fucking Ludwig Gorson motherfucker he's perfect but yeah uh the I don't mind the deep fake in Rogue One I just accept it as being like not all the CG in any of the movies is perfect it's not sometimes it goes back to just some of that shitty early CG from you know like Empire and and Jedi you know and then the weird shitty CG from the prequels like we got it in the sequels and we got it in Andor too so it didn't bother me also um, since it came out right before Carrie Fisher passed um, the first time I saw like the night that she died a friend of mine and I my friend Barbie and I went and saw Rogue One together and it was you know cathartic and I cried my heart out when they showed Leia at the end um so, anyways, I, I don't mind it so much. Because the rest of the movie is so fucking good. Why get hung up on that one thing, you know? No, I, I never get hung up on that. And, um, you know, that great uh, Darth Vader in the hallway sequence oh, at the end. Oh, that's so goddamn cool. The coolest I have ever. Where he fucking lifts ever... the guy up and then, like, shanks open his to stomach. To this day, the coolest <sighs> part, the coolest scene of Darth Vader, as far as what the guy did with the lightsaber yeah. and the force. Yeah, seeing Darth Vader be evil and use the force is so it's not something we got enough of yeah they did it in the obi-wan Kenobi yeah. series too but Which was, i like the rogue one what yeah. happened in the, the because it was the first time we saw it it's so the, shocking i just appreciate that kind of choreography yeah more than um what they were doing with between um mm-hmm. i really appreciate the 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 best sword kind of um sword fight slash yeah. lightsaber fight the laser sword. Laser. I take that later. Laser <laughs> sword. Um, no, uh, it was from Obi Wan Kenobi, and I think it was when him and Anakin were sparring. Yeah, that I thought one that was a Jedi lot of fun Temple. to watch. It was, there a was a, scene. that had a lot of meaning behind it. Mm-hmm. It was probably one of the first times I actually really appreciated their relationship. Yeah, more than uh, any of the other movies did for me. Um, it's because you didn't watch the Clone Wars. Oh God. <laughs> And as promised, today we said we were going to bring in a special guest to talk about the cartoons, the prequels, uh, actually any movie that we want to cover, whether we've already... And the games. Thank you, Maggie. We had talked about that earlier as well. Um, But yeah, as promised, uh, we got a guest today, Joey. 
Hey, what's up, y'all? <laughs> Maggie and I had a conversation earlier about how we got into Star Wars. Where, if we have that memory still of how old we were, what we thought of it when we first saw it, what movie we might have started with. Um, so, how, what what was uh, Joey's beginnings of Star Wars? Um, you know, that's a great question. Uh, it all started with my father, actually. So he was around when the original series came out. Of course, that's I feel like that's all of our starting points, right? So we had the VHS tapes of A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. So I kind of fostered a love for Star Wars naturally through my father. Uh, he showed me those films at a young age. They came out when he was going through a lot. Uh, at seven years old, my dad lost both of his parents two weeks apart in two separate car accidents. And then Star Wars came out right after that. So he kind of was able to attach himself to Luke Skywalker as an allegory of his own life, like losing his aunt and uncle and then going on into a galaxy far, far away. Like that story was something that my dad felt really personally attached to. So as I grew up, it became kind of a method of using these stories to talk to me about the real world and how to maneuver your way through things. So it started with me with the original trilogy and I remember my uncle had Return of the Jedi on VHS, so we'd go over to his house and watch Return of the Jedi. So, obviously, like, the first three for me. Um, and then one of my earliest memories, I mean, I was, I was born in 1996, so The Phantom Menace came out, like, three years after I was born. So, I'm very much a prequels kid. <laughs> my dad is such a huge um, Star Wars fan. He, I, like, ever since I was a young kid, I remember him having, like, a huge box of Marvel comics in the plastic sleeve, and then next to it, a box of Star Wars comics, primarily Dark Horse comics, so things that are very much considered legends today that don't hold up with the Disney canon, right. but I was raised with a lot of those stories um, as well. That's Is fantastic. Your dad still around? Yeah, yeah, my dad's still around. Shout out my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Pops. He'll listen to us. He will. Yeah. He probably will. Absolutely. But and my dad, mom, I was on a podcast for the first time. <laughs> my mom was like really supportive of that as well. You know, like she didn't really understand a lot of the Star Wars universe, but she'd still go outside and like, you know, swing lightsabers around me and whatnot. I'd be like, okay, you're going to be Boba Fett. She's like, uh, okay, I don't know what that is, but just run around there. Okay. So shout out to my mom as well. You know, always, you know, making me a... Uh, a Phantom Menace birthday cake with Qui-Gon and Darth Maul fighting on top of it. So it's, you know, Star Wars is something that I've just grown up with naturally. Sure. Yeah, that was something else Maggie and I had a conversation about earlier. We're, we're all born during a generation of, because since Star Wars has been around since the 70s, every decade there's another Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Ever since the 70s, um, there's never been a decade without Star Wars. And... I feel like, like you said, you were born in 96. By the time you're a toddler watching, you know, I'm sure it was on a lot, um, just since your parents were obviously fans. We all gravitate towards the first ones that we see or the ones that we find the coolest at that age. And I feel like the prequels were definitely seemed to be more aimed towards children than a general audience like the original trilogy was even though the original trilogy still made plenty of fans of kids for kids uh, or of kids and you know we were saying too that our kids they find the sequel trilogy more appealing to them they yeah my kids have always been more uh, especially force awakens fans um maggie and i think have always gravitated towards the original trilogy more than anything even though maggie and i really do uh love force awakens uh but when it comes to the prequels i i honestly can't other than i mean i, I completely understand why you like them um they they just seem like the the um like to a to a kid that's anakin skywalker's age at the time seeing a movie where you know he's what eight ten yeah i think he's nine in phantom menace yeah and yeah an eight to ten twelve year old sees that movie i can i can totally understand why they would see themselves as the character and you know be really excited about pod racing and yeah. whereas uh older more curmudgeon kind of people like myself 
my uh, sneer at that a little bit. It, no, this isn't me anymore. This is more like in 99 when I watched it. I'm 18 years old in 99, and uh, a Star Wars movie is finally coming out for the first time because when the original trilogy was out, I think uh, Return of the Jedi was 83, and I was two when that came out. So I missed the entire tr uh, original trilogy, but by the time I'm a um, eight to ten really into the original trilogy it's the only thing I have of course I'm gonna eat it up um, the only other movies that came out um, I think it was late 80s early 90s you had the Ewok movies that were <laughs> so bad <laughs> so right. I've seen clips I've never <laughs> seen like a whole Ewok movie to this day I still haven't seen the um the holiday special either Whew. i know i know i know it's like you're not a real fan until you've braved but i feel like that's like time, a rhyme passage it's no, such are, a real fan. you are a real fan and yeah sure maybe one day you, you'll be like all right i'm gonna devote i'm gonna waste my time and, and watch this weed. and a, a lot of weed. <laughs> but i there's no amount of weed that will make that show that holiday special more tolerating it is so bad you know what's funny is like i still know what life day is and i still <laughs> will wish people a happy life happy day life when day. christmas comes around i don't know where in my large organ in my brain of useless star wars information i even knew about that tidbit but i use it all the time um also i just i really love the way that you describe um, that cycle of growing up with a certain set of Star Wars movies. I didn't even realize, you're so right, every decade there's been some kind of Star Wars content that's been released. Yeah, Whether it's movies, a TV show, there's something that comes out on the big screen for new generations to enjoy. And see, like, as a kid, I, one of my earliest memories of watching the prequels was somehow um, my dad figured out how to bootleg attack of the clones on our really shitty dell computer um <laughs> nice. you know i must have been like five or six years old and it would only play for the beginning chase scene with like zam Wazell and like getting through that like coruscant sequence the assassination attempts on padme amidala and then it'd crash out so i didn't oh, no. really see the full-length movie until after it came out in theaters we got the dvd but I remember so many people hating on those movies and hating on um, Jar Jar, especially in Phantom Menace. I gotta say the like happiest Star Wars memory I have, like core memory from my childhood, was when Revenge of the Sith came out. Now I was in like second or third grade. I was a pretty small kid. And I remember going to movies and seeing their big Revenge of the Sith poster hanging. I remember it had Anakin Skywalker with his lightsaber out and had his cape billowing in the wind. And the cape formed into Vader's mask as like a foreshadowing of this is it. This is the movie where we're going to see Anakin finally take that plunge to the dark side and become Darth Vader. And I was just so excited. Like it felt like every month, every week, every day was going by so slow, so slow. I just couldn't wait for it to get it. It wasn't May 4th, but I think it was maybe May 18th or May 19th. Um, I'm looking it up. I gotta, I gotta get this down. Um, May 19th. Yeah, I was right. So May 19th, <laughs> 2005. I remember when that day finally came around, my dad showed up to school and pulled me out of class at like 1130 so we could go catch the earliest matinee. And I just remember being that total punk kid who was like, oh, you guys going to be here all day? And all my like peers were like, yeah. Yeah, we're, wh why else would we not be here all day at school? And I was like, oh, well, my dad's going to take me to see the new Star Wars. You know, like that was um and that that title screen hit that title sequence revenge of the sith hit leading into the space battle over coruscant to retrieve the chancellor and my jaw was just wide open the whole time my eyes were wide um i yeah. also was a big fan of like the 2003 micro series by gendy tartakovsky shout out to that incredible animator thank you for an awesome childhood also loved samurai jack Ooh, um yeah samurai jack yeah, Powerpuff Girls, Dexter Zive, mm. all that. That guy made the original micro series of the Clone Wars where we get introduced to characters like Asajj Ventress and General Grievous. Um, and the way that that series ended, ended with the capturing of Chancellor Palpatine, Mace Windu crushing his voice box, and then Anakin and Obi-Wan preparing to take him back in the skies above Coruscant. And that was like the in-canon excuse for Grievous coughing all the time. Now you just, it's just what he does. Interesting. Um, but yeah. I never knew that. I wanted to finish a thought that I had a second ago, which was uh, 
if you ever have a chance, um, uh, the holiday special is not on Disney Plus, so don't worry about that. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, there's a short animated feature, or not feature, there's a short animated um, video on Disney Plus that's from the holiday special with Boba Fett. I don't know if you've seen that, with the, where he rides the Mythosaur, and he, um, it's, the it, it's the first official introduction of Boba Fett in animated form, um, which is on Disney+. Plus. I think it was the only really fun, exciting uh, part of the holiday special was that little animated short. And then I also wanted to say that if, there, if you're ever curious as well of the, the Ewok movies, I don't remember which one it is at the moment, um, but I, I do have a recommendation if you ever want to watch an Ewok movie. Actually, yeah. That was the first thing I dressed up for for Halloween was as an Ewok. Nice. Yeah. I'd love to see an Ewok film. I love the Ewoks. They get a lot of hate, you know, for, for taking down the Stormtroopers. And they're all armored and whatnot. And, you know, how could some teddy bears with sticks and rocks beat the Imperial Army? It's like, dude, they had the home field advantage. They, they knew their land. You know, and uh, the Empire, they didn't, they didn't know who they were messing with. I love Warwick Davis, and even though you never see him, um, I think the thing that really made me love Ewoks were the Ewok movies. There were two of them. One was from 1984 called, uh, I think it was called uh, The Ewok Adventure. And then there's another one called The Battle, the Battle for Endor. Um, and at this... At this moment, I can't remember which one I had on VHS as a kid, because they both look, <laughs> they both look like the movie I'm thinking of. Um, I know I only saw one of them, so I might as well uh, go since Disney Plus has them right now. I might watch those just for uh, nostalgia's sake. But I remember really loving those movies because of the creature effects more than anything. They had some really neat stop motion creatures in that movie. Um, some of them were legitimately scary for a kid, um, and I think it'd be really fun to go back and look at some of those. So, Joey, another thing we wanted to talk about was the Clone Wars animated series. Mm. I have been trying to get through to 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 get to season at least three and four, where yeah. I've been told. That's where the story really picks up. Um, the animation gets better. The, the writing is better. But I'm still in season one because it's it's kind of a... I hate... I, I have to be... Yeah, it's a slog. I Oh, it is. I'm a completionist. So I, I can't just watch the best of episodes that they, ma- they have made lists of, uh, which Maggie has tried to watch uh, the best of episodes and still can't get through those. Nope. But I... I I really am interested in your take on the animated series and why it has become special to you. Well, a lot like the prequels, uh, the Clone Wars is also something that I kind of grew up with. Uh, I mean, you have to take into consideration, this goes for anybody who's trying to binge watch the Clone Wars. It is not only a marathon, it is it is a labor. You know, like, like the... 12 labors of hercules except for it's the freaking eight seasons of clone wars or nine seasons of clone like this show went on for 15 years it just ended you know i was in the sixth grade when they dropped the new clone wars and they were basically rewriting the 2003 clone wars and i was like what this is kind of frustrating to me because the the micro series was so it was the whole thing put together is two and a half hours long and now you have this long drawn out telling of the clone wars which admittedly i think was actually necessary if you want to grasp everything that anakin skywalker went through during the the clone wars um and then this introduction of of ahsoka tano i think that's like the the most crucial most important aspect of the clone wars at least nowadays looking back on it when i first you know was introduced to ahsoka tano i was like oh come on like she's gonna die like obviously like why are we creating this character and getting attached to her just to you know have vader ultimately kill her but no disney's really done a really great job with expanding on her story i think and so 
I've tried rewatching Clone Wars now, you know, like I watched it as I grew up kind of throughout middle school and then high school and then college. Um, it finished up just like, what, two years ago or something? Feels like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They finally just released the final season of Clone Wars. It is a slog. It is definitely a slog. Do I love it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I'm so glad that I was able to get through it, um, especially because we get... Yeah, the final season of Clone Wars was released in 2020, y'all, so four wow, years even ago. Four years ago, wow. Um, but still, it feels like Time's just far. yesterday. <laughs> um, the things that I really love about the Clone Wars is that it expands on a lot of lore. Um, I think that it's kind of damage control for the prequels. Um, admittedly, I love Hayden Christensen. I think he's a great actor. What he was given, um, the the script he had to work with, the timeline he had to work with, I mean, they didn't give a lot for him to work with, and George wanted him to be very over the top. He wanted him to be that disgruntled, angry, um, outrageous, angsty, you know, late teen, early 20-something-year-old who's going to go to the dark side, but there wasn't a lot of redeeming qualities for him, Um, you know? I mean, even as a Padawan, we see him commit genocide. Like, you know, looking back on that as an adult... I'm like, well, sh- dude, he should just be Vader right then and there. Like, you're going to wipe out an inside. Sure, like, they murdered his mother, but, you know, you're going to kill the women and the children, too. Like, jeez, dude, that's pretty dark. So Clone Wars kind of gave us that Anakin Skywalker that was the general, that was the teacher, that was someone for the next generation of Jedi to look up to. And it gave us an Anakin Skywalker that was relatable and that had depth and that had an overarching story about all the little things that made him turn and all the things that were holding him to the principles of the Jedi order. So yeah, kind of a much like how bad batch and, um, you know, rebels and these other series that are coming out, these other movies, the, the Ray movie, I think is kind of going to be doing damage control for rise of Skywalker and explaining how Palpatine came back. Mm. The clone wars very much acted as a uh, damage control for trying to tell Anakin's story and trying to tell how the Republic collapsed and all the events of the war. Uh, there's a uh, joke that I like to tell some if star Wars fans, especially if uh, rogue one was damage control um, of how, of why the exhaust port was such a, uh, an oversight on um, how to destroy the Death Star. And then Solo is damage control on um, the correct, using the correct terminology for a parsec. Um, that, that, that they spent all this money and used all this time just to, con- just for those, uh, those two. The, the, and then the rise of Skywalker is just, you know, <laughs> damage control for fucking the last Jedi. But that was also the, final episode in the whole series so i'm just saying a lot of damage control yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you brought up uh for okay so you brought up uh hayden christensen and i know you know of course people have always picked on him for uh, being a bad actor and um how he he just completely ruined um star wars two and three and i always like to direct people towards like you said he was giving <laughs> from from what he was given the scenes he was given, the the script he was given. Not that I'm blaming George Lucas for everything. I like to direct people towards a movie Hayden Christensen did before um, episode two. 2001, there was a movie called My Life as a House. And it stars, it's him and um, Kevin Klein. And I highly recommend anybody who's ever had any kind of negative thought about his acting. He did this really good drama i would say with kevin klein and he was given some uh, great dialogue great writing and it shows i gotta say his uh 2018 film little italy i also really like that it's like a rom-com it's it's about him and this girl that fall in love and they're both working for their dads in their respective pizza shops and they're having like a pizza feud <laughs> like they're their rival pizza shop owners um, Say less, I'm there. It's really <laughs> cute. It's really cute. And, you know, you get to see Hayden Christensen in a role where he's actually being really charming and really sweet and funny and baking pizza. And, you know, he's not killing children. <laughs> 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 I really I really enjoyed that movie. Um, and I, I think he I think he 
uh, hit it out of the park when he came back to do the Obi-Wan Kenobi show in the one episode of Ahsoka. Oh, yeah. I thought he was great in those. Uh, one of my favorites, Maggie and I had talked about this earlier, that one of my favorite lightsaber battles, it's a tie. Well, it it's the same people. It's not only in episode three at the, at the end, but I think the the duel that they do in the Obi Wan Kenobi series, um, where they're um, yeah they're having they're sparring, I thought the the fact that he came back, these two guys are much older than they used to be, and they it looks flawless. It's a great choreographed scene. Um, one of my favorite, like I said, one of my favorite uh, lightsaber duels. Hands down my favorite moments of the prequels, or really, in, in my opinion, any Star Wars media, is when I see the, those two men on screen together. Their friendship, their bond, um, their love and respect for one another, it's so genuine, and it just shows on screen so well. Um, I get a little bit teary-eyed every time there's that scene in Revenge of the Sith uh, before Obi-Wan goes to Utapau to fight General Grievous, and Anakin's bidding him farewell. Because, you know, that's their last time genuinely interacting as brothers. And even that title screen when in the beginning of Revenge of the Sith, when they're flying into battle, and there's that opening hopeful Star Wars theme, but there's these like, dung, 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 mm. drums in the background. That's just John Williams being brilliant, shouting out that, hey, this is the last time they ride into battle together. You know it's coming. I gotta say, the way the fandom treats any of the actors is really sad. I, and something that I'm really happy about with modern time Star Wars is seeing actors like Ahmed Best and Hayden Christensen get a chance to shine again on film and to be embraced by the fandom, to see that again. Um, Hayden Christensen crying in appreciation at the fans cheering him on at Star Wars Celebration, or Ahmed Best being the Jedi Master who <laughs> rescues Grogu from the I Jedi Temple. I enjoyed that. I love that. I, I thought that was a great, hey, sorry about what happened, but here's, here's a, um, or, as Maggie, right. as Maggie uh, has put it in the past, he got his flowers. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. I love that. Yeah, like these are really capable and amazing actors, and they're just doing a job. Um, I mean, I was part of a student film recently for a friend, and I was supposed to be some psychopathic killer, and I had to say the line, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, eyes, ears, ass, nose, and make it sound serious and creepy, and let me tell you, that was really hard. You know, you're given a script, and you're given a task, and you carry it out the best that you can, and there are times where, you know, it is the actor's fault, like, I think hate like uh Kristen stewart and twilight is the easiest thing that comes to mind like she had wiggle room to play with she had stakes to play with but she just kind of fell flat um however i really like her in underwater i'm just gonna say i'm not a Kristen stewart hater i think that she's really come a long way i just saw that her in love great. lies bleeding um fantastic film and she does a great job she yeah. nailed it um she was in a movie with jesse eisenberg in 2015 called american ultra which I um, I not a, I'm not the biggest fan of Jesse Eisenberg either, but yeah. the two of them in American Ultra, I thought it's, sometimes it's it's the script or the um, the direction that they're given. Maybe you know how many takes does it take sometimes to get the the best line, and how many take you know sometimes for money because of you know time is money. Let's do it fast, less takes. Let's get through it. Maybe you know you don't get the best lines. Yeah, I mean, end of the day, like these actors are just trying to do a job you know you think about actors also like john boyega who is finn or kelly marie tran who played rose tico um i mean to be bullied for a role that you played to the point where you just kind of hide from society in general that that's that's a problem and a reflection on the fandom you know i know a lot of people didn't like the ending of game of thrones but i haven't heard any of those actors having to go through such lengths to avoid vitriol it's a very good point yeah you don't hear just because of, you know walking dead um it ended terribly and i think i missed i think i skipped the last four seasons just because the writing just got so bad but then i at the same time i i never heard a story about a walking dead writer or a walking dead actor being threatened because you know they were ruining their childhood or you know a, a, one of their favorite comic books or whatever yeah. the case may be it just shows i don't know if these are we could talk all day about the toxicity of fans and where they come from and if they were ever true fans before 
um, this new generation of uh, Star Wars started with J.J. Abrams and Disney. You know, we've talked about the Clone Wars uh, animated series, and I know you're a big fan of Rebels and the Bad Batch, uh, which of, of all the stuff that I see on YouTube and from other fan sites that I go to, uh, the the biggest I think the biggest talked about animated series that I've heard even more than Clone Wars even though I know it was huge and people love Ahsoka and um, and all that but I think the Bad Batch uh, specifically I've been hearing so much praise for um, mm. I, they just finished their third season yeah yeah so the third season uh, final episode came out today I watched it this morning actually nice. Well, uh, I know absolutely nothing about Rebels or um, The Bad Badge. So um, what is it about these two shows that you love uh, so much? Um, You know, about any of these series, whether it's uh, live action or animated, I would love any kind of series that ties into the main timeline and that expands more on the lore of Star Wars. I mean, that's really what I'm about is the lore. So... I think Bad Batch Bad Batch takes place right after Revenge of the Sith, so right after Order 66 falls, you see Caleb Doom, who becomes Kanan Jarrus in Rebels, uh, witness his master's execution, and you follow this like rogue force, uh, Clone Troop 99, and they're all the kind of quote-unquote like misfits. You know, Echo was turned into a human computer by the Separatists to kind of learn all of their strategies and formations he has like a missing arm that turns into a tool that he can use to like hack into different computer systems and whatnot it kind of looks like a screwdriver um then you got wrecker who's been just like he's just a roided out clone um and you know hunter who's much like his namesake a hunter he's good at tracking and everything and crosshair is a sniper you get these very mutated very enhanced clones and when that series first came out, I was like, okay, like, we're going to follow a clone troop? Like, I, I don't know. We just finished up the Clone Wars. Now you want to follow, like, a specific clone squadron? Okay, I wasn't really on board with it with the first season. It didn't have too much of a of an arc. Like, it was kind of about these clones on the run. And then season two kind of plays into um, a project that the Empire is funding that I don't really want to spoil with how soon Bad Batch has just been released. Mm. But season three um, follows up on it and it has implications that follow all the way through to the end of the Emperor's life. So it's really fascinating stuff. And the main character, Omega, gives us new things to kind of explore in the Star Wars universe as well. Uh, Rebels, on the other hand, is exploring new characters. Um, one of my favorite in that squadron of Rebels that comes together is uh, Zeb, Gera Zeb Aurelius, and he's uh, a Lassat alien. And the Lassat is actually taken from the original blueprint of what a Wookiee was supposed to look like, what mm. Chewbacca was supposed to look like, this very bat-like Sasquatch animal, and that's Garazeb Aurelius, and he's, like, the tough guy of the group, and, you know, he's if anyone's ready to brawl, it's Zeb, you know. And you got Ezra Bridger from Lothal, and he gets taken under the wing by Kanan Jarrus, and his lover, Harrison Dula, who's the daughter of champion ryloth uh rebellion leader um general syndula cham syndula so there's like a legacy to live up to there and then he got the most murderous droid in the world chopper who i just freaking love i love that little <laughs> astromech droid he's so crazy um and sabine wren who's a mandalorian and a punk at heart and an artist whose character is just really wonderful to follow um one thing that rebels does wonderfully is it follows up on stories like what happened with rex Ahsoka falls into play. She's like their secret rebel informant for a while who ties them into the rest of the Rebel Alliance. And you see her first confrontation with Darth Vader in that series. You also, for fans who are really huge on the Old Republic, such as myself, get to see the Sith world Malachor, which is like, oh my god, we're bringing Malachor back in a canon, yes! You get to see Darth Maul come back, too, who, you know, (laughs) when you leave him in Clone Wars, you're like, how did you even make it, bro? I mean, in general, I could go into the, the whole tangent of Maul, but I'll save that for later. And you get to see what happens between him and Obi-Wan. Uh, one of my favorite moments in all of Star Wars history is Maul's true death when he tracks down Kenobi to Tatooine and they face off for the first time. Maul tries to kill Obi-Wan with the same move that he used on Qui-Gon, but as he goes to hit 
Kenobi in the forehead with the hilt of a lightsaber. Obi-Wan slashes right through, and he holds him in his dying moments, and Maul asks, is he, is he the chosen one? Referring to Luke Skywalker, who Obi-Wan's defending. And Obi-Wan says he is, and Maul says then he will avenge us all, and he dies in Kenobi's arms. And I think that is, like, the truest display of unity we see between the Jedi and the Sith and all of Star Wars so far, and it's such a beautiful moment for both of those characters' arcs. Um... It's one. Of, I, I mean, Sam Witwer, who voiced uh, Star Killer for the Force Unleashed games, which I grew up playing, who also voiced Darth Maul, he does a whole breakdown on that sequence and that fight scene. Mm. Um, you also get introduced to the world between worlds. You see Ezra Bridger resist the influence of Palpatine to give him access to the world between worlds, so Palpatine can go freely throughout any point in the timeline throughout the universe. And Bridger destroys this apparatus in front of him, even though he's offered a chance to be with his family again his parents again he resists the pull of the dark side he resists palpatine um one of the only jedi other than ezra bridger to do so we know legends such as dooku and anakin could not do that and ezra did so i really like ezra as a character for that and just how much he's had to go through there, there's a lot there's a lot to be pulled from rebels it just really is a shame that they made those lightsaber blades so damn skinny <laughs> i mean yeah that's really my biggest the only thing that i have negatively to say about rebels is like the animation uh, you look at it and it's it's like why <laughs> that's what i love about a, a star wars nerd we we always we obsess over it we we start you know, we we point things out that we lo- love about it what we dislike about it, you know nitpick about things because it's fun and it's fun having those conversations and you can have somebody who's seen the same thing as you respond well i thought they were uh, an okay size or you know however the conversation might go and it's it's that's what i love about uh, uh fun this is why it, it can be it can be fun and you don't have to fight about it yeah yeah that's the big thing right is you always, I always come back to the point when I'm having Star Wars discussions with people like, dude, this is a space fantasy. Yeah. Like, can we please remember that this is a space fantasy? I know we all grew up with this. It has a personal meaning to all of us, but that doesn't mean that it's the end all be all of how you view other people and how you classify other people or talk about other people. Whether it be the actors who did the works or people's opinions on it. Um, I mean, me, for example, like... I thought Andor was really cool. It wasn't my favorite in the series. And for that, I catch a lot of like hate for that. And I really liked Book of Boba in the Kenobi series. And people are like, those were a disgrace. And I just, sorry, I really liked them. Um, it's a space fantasy. You, right. can, you can like what you like. About I, yeah, and I totally get that. Maggie and I had, this is another conversation Maggie and I had where we compared it to the 80s Ghostbusters movies versus the more modern uh, specifically the last two Ghostbusters movies. If you don't like where where they're taking a certain story, how they're progressing it forward, um, like the last two Ghostbusters movies, you don't have to watch them. None of this stuff, nobody's forcing anybody to watch any of this stuff. Right. And um, so to say that these new movies, whether it's Star Wars, uh, Ghostbusters, um, the MCU it if if what they're doing isn't your jam don't watch it and essentially i feel like i'm not trying to purposely just be like uh animation i don't want to watch that stuff it's not my star wars i'm just never like i do i see the joy people have from watching it the the people my age even um loving the animated stuff um i really want to get into rebels and the bad batch the the stuff they're talking about coming out in film for the old republic stories that they're talking about that they're teasing could be coming i'm really excited for i'm i've always been i've never played any of the old republic games um oh don't get me started (laughs) i've always wanted to i've never played the only star wars games i have played were uh force unleashed uh, which I love, Star Killer. Um, oh yeah, especially Force Unleashed Two. Maggie knows I we I downloaded a demo from Xbox of it one time. Just played through the demo over and over and over b- until I finally decided I'm just gonna buy the game and finally play it. And had a blast with that. I'm a, I love Star Wars Battlefront. 
Um, I am a force to be reckoned with in the air. I'm t- I'm a terrible um, soldier on the ground. But <laughs> put me in a put me in a Tie Fighter interceptor, and I'm 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 scary. I um, love those space <laughs> battles. I love taking a gunship full of troops and going onto the enemy uh, command ship and just wreaking havoc from the inside. I those space battles in Battlefront Two are so much fun. <laughs> so much fun. Um, all this to say, I am not gonna yuck other people's yum. I I'm so happy that Star Wars has is trying to at least they could have just kept at the original three. Or even worse, we could just have the very first Star Wars that's just called Star Wars, no episode title, and that's it. It could have just been this cool sci-fi movie from the 70s that people might be like, hey, did you ever see this movie? And be like, oh, I never saw that one. Um, So it's fun that we got a trilogy. It's fun that they made another trilogy. And we just, there's always Star Wars. And if it's not your thing anymore to, to be into new characters that represent and reflect modern society then it's not for you go back and watch the 70s and 80s stuff if um if you're not in the animation don't watch the animation if you're not into obi-wan or boba fett or mandalorian nobody's forcing you to watch it and that's what i love about current disney star wars is that it is giving everybody of all races sexes doesn't matter where you grew up it's just a, it's a wide variety wide spectrum of um, star wars content out there now and they're still planning on making even more and i'm excited personally i'm excited about andor season two um there's so many characters in there that i can't wait to see where their story's going leading up to uh, rogue one which maggie and i had talked about earlier as being one of our favorite star wars movies ever um all this to say that um, I yes, I love Star Wars, and I I really hope one day it's not going to be this year. <laughs> I hope to one day go to a Star Wars celebration. Um, I've seen so many YouTube videos of panels of just the the main floor of how just, people are just there not to yuck everybody's yum but to celebrate star wars and you know every, everybody has their place they can go in that uh for that convention um past present future uh take your pick uh but whatever it is you get to celebrate star wars which i find so much fun uh, being a fan as it should be right and you know star wars celebration is a place where you can show up and you can dress as you know, you can dress as someone from the Old Republic times, like Exar Kun, or you can dress as Mandalore the Ultimate, or you can show up as Galen Starkiller, and no one's, you know, it's going to be Star Wars. No one's going to banish you from Star Wars Celebration for that. Um, and just kind of listening to what you were saying kind of spurred this thought in my head of there's a beautiful thing called having headcanon, right? Like, it's because this is all fantasy, and there's all this expansive lore in the um and what's now considered legends in the extended universe as well as like the new canon you can determine what is real in your mind because it's all fiction it's all fantasy right so if you don't want to in your head say that like the disney canon is the real star wars it doesn't have to be like you can still go and read the dark empire comic book series you can read the, the heir to the empire book series you can you know play video games like Star Wars Jedi Academy or Jedi Outcast um, or the Old Republic. Like, you, you can you can find these stories that you enjoy. You can find something you enjoy or write a fanfic. There's tons of them out there. Kind of tying back to what you were talking about in the beginning of different generations growing up with Star Wars, I remember seeing a lot of people as a kid really hate on the prequels, really not like the prequels, and it bummed me out as a kid. Fast forward decades later, the sequels come out, and I left the theater of Force Awakens initially, like, really displeased, because I was still really attached to the expanded universe. I was attached to the stories that I grew up reading with my dad that were about, you know, Jaina Solo and Jason Solo and Anakin Solo. And now we just got Ben Solo, who's Kylo Ren. And there's a lot of, like, inspirations for Kylo Ren through Jason Solo and his fall to the dark side. There's a lot of kind of 
tie-ins there. But I, was, I wasn't ready to let go of that yet, necessarily, on the big screen. But then I started to see, you know, little girls do their hair in, in the way that Ray does and dress up as Ray for Halloween. And I was seeing, like, small black boys dressing up as Finn. And I was like, man, I'm not going to be the jerk that I was when I was a kid growing up. Like, this is their Star Wars now. And then Last Jedi came out, and I actually really liked that movie. Like, everyone really doesn't like that movie, but I was so stoked with the direction Ryan Johnson went. Uh, I really liked seeing Luke kind of go to exile himself and replay the patterns of the Jedi Order and say, like, the Jedi Order is flawed. It's failing. It's done. Um, that was really refreshing for me because I do think that as wonderful as the Jedi are and as heroic as they are and how much good they've put out in the galaxy to deprive any child of their family, of their emotions and their attachments is going to lead to ruin. And we see this with Luke a little bit. We see this with Anakin big time. We see this in the Old Republic with Revan's story and the Mandalorian Crusade. It's it's something that's kind of perpetuated throughout time. Um, one of my favorite quotes in that movie altogether is when Luke says, the Jedi thought that the Force was theirs and theirs alone. Um, that's vanity. You know, I love that take. And I loved seeing Kylo Ren kill Snoke and take the throne for himself and kind of evolve into a greater villain. I was really hoping they'd commit to that. As much as I love Dark Empire series and the resurrection of Palpatine, Rise of Skywalker... It just, it just felt very thrown together at the last minute because it was. And it was, you know, it was an appeasement to the fans who were mad at The Last Jedi. So <laughs> Maggie's behind you, the green, because we, we talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we felt the same way. But how much do you love Poe Dameron? Oh, <laughs> Poe Poe's great. I do like Poe. I was honestly a big fan for the Finn Poe. Uh, I was shipping that. I was really yeah, hoping yeah. they'd take that route. Woo! Um, you know... I was really hoping that they'd stick with Rey being a nobody, too. That was something they explored in in The Last Jedi that I really enjoyed. And I think that she was a powerful character on her own two feet. I would have really liked to see her kind of blossom into owning her own power. Um, You know, and, oh gosh, I can hear the outcries of fans right now talking about her being a Mary Sue. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to get into it. So is fucking Luke Skywalker. Dude. Luke Skywalker is a Mary Sue. He's just a male, so it's okay. You want to know who the biggest Mary Sue in all of Star Wars is, though? You want to hear my hottest take? Darth Maul. Let's break it down. Okay, so yeah, he he was raised as a Sith Lord by Palpatine, the Dark Lord of the Sith. You know, all that makes sense, taken from his homeworld of Dathomir. But where it starts getting into the territory of how does this actually happen, we see at the end of The Phantom Menace, this man gets sliced in half and falls down a trash chute hundreds of feet. And now, keep in mind, this man is literally just a torso with a head and arms, and his all of his internal organs are completely exposed to whatever garbage is accumulated on the plane of Naboo. There could be Gungan eyes in there. There could be ship reactors in there. There's probably tons of rusty metal bits and he's getting transported from there on board another ship taken across the galaxy to another planet filled with trash where he just hates himself a pair of spider legs and eats rats for 10 years and goes crazy just going kenobi like that was his reason you know the fandom is willing to accept like oh yeah his he's just so strong in the dark side like his petty hatred for kenobi kept him alive he was able to use a force to make himself robot legs but like ray flying a ship is that doesn't make sense to you like it's but she used the force for the first time better than any other character in the history of Star Wars. She also like grew up on a desert planet where she had to take care of herself and survive. Do you think she doesn't know how to kick some ass? Oh, and she was guaranteed using the force whether or not she knew it all of her life. Um, there's no other way a, a small child could survive on their own in the desert. Whether it was intuition through the force, feeling where to find water or food, or finding where to find supplies. Like The, the force is naturally, innately powerful within her um and and that's something that's pretty self-explanatory when you watch his sequels whereas you know with maul it's like he literally just hates himself back to life if you want to talk about another sith lord who hates himself into immortality darth scion who's like the ultimate chad of the sith and 
the old republic games like like i said don't get me started this man <laughs> literally in your final boss fight with him you have to break his will to just finally let go and die like you strike him down like five or six times before he finally decides okay yeah this existence sucks i'll die like um he is held together by pieces of his body he has one eye that's completely out fun fact uh the ahsoka series that big hyperspace ring they used to jump in outside of the galaxy to find thrawn they called that ring the eye of scion which is a reference to darth scion who is this sith lord who has kept himself alive through hating himself and everything like we can do that and that's okay but ray can't be good at things i you know, come on. <laughs> like, the Force. That's why, okay? The Force. We can always rely on that. Um, I mean, I gotta say, I do love Darth Maul, and I do support the hating yourself through the Force, but come on, like, let Rey be good at things, too. If you can make that okay, like, let Rey be good at things. Like, let her be able to mind trick somebody. Let her be able to fly a freaking ship. Like, she didn't get her head cut off and screw it back together as parts she scavenged in Tatooine, but, like, Darth Maul, we could do that with. Like, what? I, I don't know. Jakku, sorry, getting my desert planets mixed up. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Joey, this has all been absolutely wonderful. Um, if there is anything else you'd like to bring up about our beloved Star Wars, uh, what would you like to uh, say? What, how would you like to end it, I guess, is the best way. Um, I mean, just, just, you know, give a shout out to George Lucas, especially for making all of this possible. I know that when he first started with a new hope it was just such a pipe dream and it was such a chaotic production schedule um his overhead was so huge because he had to come up with his own sound production company skywalker sound and lucasfilm productions so and a lot of people were their careers were hinging on the success of this movie and now here we are decades later you got expansive tv shows video games comic books books that we've all loved um you know despite like not always agreeing with his choices with his scripts in the prequels or how he's done things i think it's that lightning in a bottle that he caught with the original trilogy that is just so much energy that spawned out into generations to come to tell their own stories into things as beautiful as visions where we can see cross-cultural stories through star wars um where now star wars is in the hands of the world and it is such a beautiful thing to witness and i am so happy to be part of this community well, Joey, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here today, joining us, uh, nerding out over Star Wars. Um, we love just having some fun conversations about it. And, uh, yeah, this has been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks Thank for having you. me. Love you guys. Love you. Before we wind down this completely, I've already talked at length about how much I adore uh, General Leia Organa and everything that she is, was, and will always be. Um, but Caveman, who's your favorite Star Wars character of all of them? <laughs> you know, we took a little bit of a, a tiny break right before recording this very moment. Yeah. And during that moment, I was like, when I come back, I'm going to ask her a question. <laughs> And it was this exact same question, except with one exception. What? Um, you couldn't include, like, top build characters. Oh, it's so, like minor characters? Like, a little more minor. Not... It, yeah, I... Because, you know, we could all say, like, a Han Solo... I wish Solo, you could see my face right now. Or it's... a Poe Dameron. Mm. Or uh, whoever you might... Do droids count? You know what? Droids could count because it is a character that's not really well, we should top ask build. who's your favorite droid uh who's your who is your favorite well droid? you know we're getting away from this okay so we've got all right so we're not we can't get any further because we'll talk for another hour and a half um so i'm gonna you're gonna tell me your favorite star wars character okay and then i'm gonna tell you my favorite secondary b-grade star wars character okay which i'm gonna have to think about while you answer the first one and oh, then we're gonna boy. pick favorite droid and there's no point in picking favorite villain because it's Darth Vader and we all know it. So, like, right, right, right. Okay. So, um, so who's your favorite Star Wars character and why? Imperial Guard number two. You motherfucker. <laughs> you motherfucker. <laughs> That's his dream cosplay. That is my dream cosplay, actually. The Imperial Guard. Number two. <laughs> <laughs> 
works. It's such a cool costume. <laughs> it's such a cool costume. They're they're red. All the red like like bad guys. All the red stormtrooper costumes fucking slap. Yeah, special the specifically the ones from Return of the Jedi. Yeah. That's not an easy question just because I, it's easy for me, but that's because of it's different for me. It's between Chewbacca mm-hmm. and R two D two. Fair. I think those two characters, mainly because those two characters, especially, oh, I mean, span they've... almost every R2 single movie. R two and three PO have been there from the beginning, but R two, you know, just beeps, so you, he's not as. There's annoying. a whole argument you can make that R two D two is the actual savior of the rebellion, and it's, it's, the there's universe no in argument general. that needs to be made. It's it's truth. just a fact. I, I just didn't know if we needed to go through. No, that. we don't need to. Like we are like, all aware that without all the... R two, the universe. Can we spend the next fucked. hour talking about how R two D two saved the entire universe <laughs> and the that rebellion? That can be for another Star Wars special. Other than R two D two being the savior of the universe, yeah. like Flash Gordon. <laughs> um, I yeah, Chewbacca. Chewy. He's just a gr- like, like he's fucking Chewbacca. He's a character that I have never heard a single word he says Hmm. i i know there are subtitles out there wow in joke form and in serious form like there was a script written with chewbacca's lines i think um i think peter mayhew might have been the only one to be on the receiving end of that and he spoke those lines on set and then they were um covered in uh, chewbacca roars later but yeah, live on set he had yeah, lines. Yeah, but okay. And, so, but Chewie but, but yeah, is what my perfect. my point is, it, it's a character that I've I've never heard. I don't understand his language, but it's his actions, his loyalty, his his brilliance, his um, willing to fight to the end for his friends, for his sense of humor. He does have a sense of humor. He's uh, a talented mechanic, even though he does kind of break the falcon a lot but he knows how to fix it. he knows how to fix it and every he's and he's he's a true leader too he's a talented pilot um sidekick man he's better he's probably one of the best heroic sidekicks if i had to flush out like my top five favorite star wars characters chewbacca is easily second or third I, I mean, me putting Poe before Chewbacca seems disingenuous to what Chewie has been through. So it would probably go Leia, Chewie, Poe. And then when me. you think that he dies in movie nine or whatever yeah. that was. No, you're heartbroken. I was you're heartbroken. Like, they, they fucking, they did that to Admiral Akbar. They're doing it to Chewie now. Admiral Akbar didn't even get any kind of cool send off. He nope. was just on gone. screen and then he was gone. Yeah. And, Which and is another thing I'll never forget. And I was Ryan sad. For. I Blowing was... up Black One <laughs> and killing off uh, uh, yes. Admiral Akbar like that. Like fuck you, Ryan Johnson. Yeah, that was terrible. Han Solo's death. Yes, mm. I was. I was very saddened by Han Solo's death. I did not. I was afraid it would happen. Yeah, we all kind of saw but it I, coming. Without I, seeing it at coming. the same time, it was just like they won't. Are they're they really gonna, gonna do it? Yeah, I don't think they're gonna do Chewie's it. Chewie's reaction was heartbreaking. heartbreaking. And so when you see Chewie die in the ninth film, you're just like, like I was just so upset. Yeah. And then him coming back later was just. A, oh, such a, such a relief. Yeah, well, it's because they knew. They were like, we chewed off. I think J.J. Abrams if he killed off Chewbacca. <laughs> we can't do that. He killed off too. Han Solo. Yeah. If he killed off Chewbacca, we would have his head on a spike so in a public trouble. square. We haven't talked about the movies, uh, the Solo we story. We haven't. No. Solo, Ch- Chewie and Solo was fun. I enjoyed Solo. It's a ton of fun. Like, I get that everybody's kind of upset there wasn't a young Han Solo or a young Harrison Ford, which how can you do it? But there are things that fucking, are really I mean, stupid about it, though. Donald Glover as Lando Calrissian is the most genius fucking casting that Star Wars has ever done. Ever. That is the pinnacle of bringing fucking Donald Glover in to play Lando. It's genius. And they're always like, oh, maybe it'll happen again. Make it happen again. Make, I, want, I want him back. I know they say they're going to do it. They've been saying they're going to do it for years. I want more Donald Glover as Lando. I would love that. Give it to me. Sure. Give it to me. At the same time, it also brought us things that are canon now, like how did Han Solo get his name? Yeah. <laughs> Probably one of like God, my did eyes any rolled of us need that? so hard in the theater when I heard that. Did 
I mean, like, I am desperate to was see the Lord and Miller so version necessary? of this movie. I, but you who know, did that? Was it Lord and Miller or was it fucking what's his face? That does seem days? that almost does seem like a joke that you would have heard in the Lego movie about Han Solo. If yeah. Han Solo, the Lego character, was in that but why movie, why did he have to have? Like, why? He doesn't have to have an origin about how he got his last name. Nope. The just, Joker doesn't need an origin, and that is Han fucking Solo. Han Solo, like, it's just, his name's Han Solo. Mm-hmm. Let it be that. You don't ask Luke Skywalker why he's called Luke, like, Luke Skywalker. Like, Yeah, why are you named Skywalker? Uh, Did your dad walk on the sky once? Yeah, like, like what the fuck? That's dumb. Like, yeah. I, Anyways, um, can we talk about L3-37, um, the robot that Lando Calrissian fucked? Played by Phoebe Waller Bridge. I do she like... was delightfully sassy, and the fact that she now is the brain that exists inside of the Millennium Falcon makes me love the Millennium Falcon so much more. Like I always loved that ship. I was able to watch Solo um, before this podcast, yeah. and I haven't seen it in a while. I had I had <laughs> fun. The you know it is what it is. The acting is what it is. Um, the uh, story. The more you watch a movie, the more you appreciate it. And I think it just took time for me to finally just be like, all right, so his last name is because he was by himself. Yeah. It's dumb. It's dumb. But I, I, it gets glossed over now. Yeah. And now we're just on to the next scene. I get to see more interactions. It's sort of like me with... watching The Lion King and seeing Mufasa die right. and me just being like, oh, and next. Next. I get to see more Han and Chewie hang out. I get yeah, to see which is joyful. Some... Emphis Nest, the Emphis quote Nest unquote was bad cool. guy. Emphis Nest was like I have her Funko Pop. I think she's gorgeous. First of all, Aaron Kellyman is so beautiful. Secondly, like I just loved that this like vicious, you know, marauder was a young teenage girl who was, you know, starting the rebellion. Like I fucking loved that. Um you know, a uh, Lando, Han, and Chewie all had great chemistry. Like, for me, it's just sort of dumb fun. Like, it's just there. I enjoy Woody Harrelson in it. Um, I completely forgot. I happened to pull up IMDb um, to look at the cast. I totally forgot Paul Bettany was in it. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I no, you're right. You. I, right. Like, who's the who's yeah. the villain of of uh, Solo? And I'm, uh, I don't remember. And, uh, yeah, as soon as he comes on screen, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Paul Bettany. Uh, John cool. Favreau's weird little alien guy was cool for the three seconds he was on screen. That's right. Like Hiking up his pants to because he had a butt crack showing. Yeah, oh, well, that yeah. was unnecessary. Um, they did that in uh, episode two as well. Yeah. Butt cracks. Anytime, I don't need alien, to see... Alien CG butt cracks are a big thing in Star I Wars. Need, I don't need the... See, so it's this... chopping off hands. <laughs> actually, that'd be some great trivia. I actually, I've always wondered how many hands have been chopped off in Star Wars history. I, Google's got to know. It's just one of those things where it's a tradition that almost every movie has to have a hand chopped off. Same thing with the Wilhelm scream. Which, if you don't know what the Wilhelm scream is, I'm going to insert the audio here. <laughs> and that is the Wilhelm scream. It's a very famous scream that's used in... Um, in every Star Wars movie. In every Star Wars movie, but also in uh, cinema in general. A lot of directors like to be like, yeah, I use the Wilhelm scream in my movie. So I'm seeing somewhere on the internet, uh, somewhere around 12. But every a... time I click on a thing, it doesn't give me a direct like answer. Like, this is how many and, like it's descriptions of everything you're seeing, and I can't figure it out. So it's looking around... 13 12 or 13 um although all limbs is 23 yeah okay so so r2 we, we you answered your question about yes. uh it's r2 <laughs> and chewy which is that's what we're regardless talking about. respectful um i yeah I, maggie who's my favorite, favorite secondary character is really tough because i am just trying to like i'm literally pulling up the cast list on IMDb and looking at them going, oh, but do they count? Like, you know, does Chirrut Emway count as a secondary character or is he a main character? Um, sure. Like, are we talking... That's, I guess I also was I was just thinking, when the question was asked to me, I guess I was just thinking about the 11 movies and <laughs> not... The only 11 movies? Yeah. <laughs> just the 11 movies. Just 11. I wasn't oh, thinking movies. about anything. I oh. wasn't thinking about the TV shows. Um, yeah, because I mean that would probably be Mando, you know, but he's a main build well, character. He is a main character, so you could choose so, uh, 
I know it's not an easy. It's, it's not. But to narrow it down, maybe maybe for your just in the movies, question, maybe for your question, Mon Mothra. Just the, Mon Mothra. Yeah. Um, especially seeing her after Andor. Andor. Um, she's going back to Andor because it's perfection. She's so fucking good in that. You and don't, watching you don't what realize. this woman has to go through. Yeah. I also really love the joke in uh, the Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Spoof, no, the um, Family Guy Return of the Jedi spoof, where we see Mon Mothra for the first time, and Lois as Leia is like, "Who is she? I don't like her," because <laughs> it's the first time another woman's been on screen. It's the only other woman. <laughs> um, so yeah, like just off the top of my head. And I'm sure, like, tomorrow I'll be like, motherfucker, I completely forgot totally about. Forgot. But Mon Mothra is just, she's bold and brave, and she's been there from the beginning, and she tries really hard, and she fails, and she tries again, and I fucking love her. So, yeah. My, my favorite character that doesn't have a lot of screen time, technically, yeah. and you could say is kind of a secondary character because, you, because of how brief their time is, mm. is Boosh. Who? Boosh, Boosh is Boosh is the character that uh, Leia pretends to be oh, as the bounty hunter. Oh, that doesn't count. It's sure just it does. Leia. It's like such a cool bounty hunter, like costume, helmet. I'm the gonna voice give it to you is just cool. Because it's Leia, and I don't want to make you wait to actually answer that question. I want to see the Boosh series. Well, we can't. Carrie's gone. Um, but I would then as well choose another droid. Um, the Always loyal and always just um, kid that's had too much sugar. BB-8. I love boy. BB-8. If you do yourself a favor out there on the internet, it exists. My favorite beach ball droid. Of, um, somebody took a bunch of John Ralphio uh, quotes from Parks and Rec and gave them to BB-8. And it's hysterical. So throughout... All his lines are Yeah, like his... a bunch of just John Ralphie lines. Because if you don't know, folks, um, yeah, Ben Schwartzman and um, Bill Hader, Bill Hader were like the original beeps of BB-8, and you can kind of hear it. Like, if you really train yourself to listen, sort of like if you really train yourself to listen to the uh, Cantina song from The Force Awakens, you can hear that it's Lin-Manuel Miranda singing it. It's Lynn Manuel Miranda and J.J. Abrams singing that song, and you can hear their voices if you train your ear well enough. You can train your ear well enough to hear Bill Hader and Ben Schwartzman. Um, I could see Bill Hader in some of the stuff when bb is like... Yeah, that's that's a good BB-8. Um, but... Uh, I've been practicing. He's... BB-8 is, is a perfect, precious boy. But yeah, so out there exists some John Ralphio quotes uh, as said by BB-8, and it's fucking hysterical, so check that out. I asked you your favorite droid. I want to know your favorite droid. I want to know your favorite droid. So, like, is that R2 and BB-8? Or since you've already used them? Because, like... True, I did already use Like, for me, BB-8's my favorite droid. Like, R2 is the fucking man. But I adore a, a little wee BB-8. I love how sweet his friendship is with Poe. Um, he's such a badass. He's such a cinnamon roll that could actually kill you. Um, he's I, precious boy. I know a lot of people may be out there screaming Chopper. Um, I know a lot of people love the character Chopper from was, Rebels. But okay, so I, I watched our only experience is because of and Ahsoka. So I have seen enough. You've seen of, Rebels? I watched like How most of the first dare season. You watch that without me? Oh God, I um, tried and I gave up. Like. <laughs> I'm just in fact, um, we tried together, and you gave up after, like, two episodes. I at least made it a handful more. But um, Chopper's, I don't know, he's fine. He's kind of annoying. He almost has too much personality for not having a voice. Like, and I he like, kind of has a voice, though. He's the, yeah. the one droid that can't, can like, sometimes you catch words that he says. But, um... But, I mean, then there's K2, who is, I mean, I, as said before, K2 is the best fucking K2SO droid. is... I can't wait to see him and Andor meet in season two. I cannot wait for K2 to come back to us. Because um, I, I do know how they get together, but I want to see it writ large. I don't think it would be L3. No, she's fun. It's also not little Dio from The Rise of Skywalker, who was cute, but just there. Um, I don't remember the droid's name in Andor. Google. I mean, like the book you read about the certain point of view. Oh you my got god! Your it had a story about R five D four. R five D four that broke my heart. the 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 R five D four story in from a certain point of view 
for A New Hope is so fucking sweet and so sad and so beautiful. He truly is the hero of that story because he understands what R2 has gone through and is force sensitive. Like he broke my heart. The Andor droid is called uh, B2 EMO, B2 EMO. I think they just called him B2, but he was that little sassy square little guy who's yeah. super cute. Um, but man, fucking K2 and BB-8 and R2, like, they're my little foul-mouthed babies. You know that R2 swears more than any other character, which is why he's all beeps. Yeah, that's. I think that's what I love about K2SO is he's given a personality that yeah. allows him to be a little bit oh my of, God, a, when he slaps Andor. of a back talker. And yeah, when he slaps Andor and he, he actually slapped. Yeah, and you can see is, him and you're, like, He's trying smile. to hide his smile. Yeah, that's so all sweet. adorable, and I'm a huge Alan Tudyk fan. Yeah, that man is the goat. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably oh go God. with K2SO. Remember when they made BB hate to go yeah. against BB-8? The opposite. Yeah, the, the fucking First Order droid. The first, um, the bla- it made him black, made him yeah. have a, like, an eviler, evil yeah. beeps. Evil beeps. Uh, and I know that he has a name, but he's forever BB-8. All right, so we answered droids. We answered our questions for the most part. I'm sure, folks, if you have any questions or comments or have made it through to the end, my God, let us know. This is... This is a long one. This was this is kind of an experiment to see whether or not we could just rant on this thing without some structure, no, and yeah, also no if we could do it while no notes toasted uh, on the fly, um, googling sometimes. Yeah, IMDb being our friends like always. Yeah, it's going to be a lot longer. It's a lot longer to record than you're going to have to listen to. But if you've made it to the end and you have any questions or comments, or just want to yell at us because we haven't watched the Clone Wars. We'll take it all at MovieMinglePod at gmail.com. And follow us at Letterbox at MovieMinglePod and our Instagram also at MovieMinglePod. Yeah, come. I'm, I might make a... Uh, well, I think it would be fun maybe if we're, if we're still doing this next May the 4th, which I'm pretty sure we will be. Maybe we can do the complete, like, all 11 movies in order of, like, we can rate them. Like, from our favorite to our least favorite. And then just see where that leads us we'll do something fun next yeah. year but we didn't like We're... i said we didn't have a chance to re we didn't think to do this with enough time to rewatch the entire series so all of this is off the cuff except and for what k-man's we... already seen and this being our um kind of first official bonus yeah. episode that we've started for may the 4th um this coming june we will have another episode down and it will be be us talking about the movie Tron Legacy. <gasps> that is going to be. This is news to me. I'm so excited. We're going to do Tron Legacy. Yay! It's going to be out in June. Don't know exactly which day in June yet, but that's the plan. Is uh, June. We're going to do every month. We're going to do an episode, a bonus episode yeah, that has to do with movies on, like, that weekend. are not uh, the movies that are not on the official list from Letterboxd. So we're gonna um, I'm... we're gonna play around with some of these. We're also gonna have something special for um, for September. Uh, yes, yeah, something special for September that we're not gonna reveal yet. Mm-mm. But it does have to do with uh, some of my favorite other favorite stories in the whole wide world. <laughs> yes, uh, um, and then October we're gonna be doing a whole month. The entire month of October is gonna be filled with spooky mm-hmm. moves. Movies, uh, we, uh, which we have a few ideas. Um, yeah, nothing set in stone yet. But we the the couple that we've come up with so far are going to be amazing. Yeah. And then same thing for Christmas. We have a special surprise to. I'm so excited for our Christmas great Christmas ideas. episode. Um, it'll be a like, whole. I can't wait for November so that we can start doing it. A whole year of fun podcast episodes coming out. And, I mean, on top of that, I definitely have aspirations that if certain friends ever come to town, like if my bestie Jesse ever comes up, uh, we will be sitting down and recording a Pride and Prejudice um, conversation because that's just, it just has to happen and will happen at some point. So, yeah, we've got a lot of good ideas for the bonus episodes. We hope you liked this one for as kind of wacky and all over the place and, you this know, is essentially ridiculous. What, if Maggie and I just sat down with each other and just decided to start nerding out over Star Wars. Yeah, this is this what This is happen. essentially what the conversation would mm-hmm. kind of sound like. With more crying and a bit more uh, swearing. And we always come up with uh, weird, wacky... Um, 
uh, what ifs sometimes when we have these conversations, especially about yeah. big fandoms like this, Batman, the Marvel. MCU. I mean, just wait till you get to hear like a real MCU, like Endgame and uh, Infinity War and Endgame are going to be very much us nerding out about a lot of Marvel stuff. Um, yes, those our, are going to be long episodes. Our Endgame episode is coming out the first Wednesday of January, which is insane to me. It's a long way I out. I can't believe you have to wait that long to talk about Bucky Barnes. I'm so sad. But we're going to get to it, and we're glad that you <laughs> stuck with us this long. Yeah, because it's so been thank you. Quite a long ride for this whole episode, but you know, happy uh, Star Wars Day. Hooray. I know uh, the new show uh, Tales of the Empire just came out on Disney Plus mm-hmm. for Star Wars Day, which looks really cool. So if you're into um, the the animated side of Star Wars. Yeah, that, watch that and love it. Yeah, go... Go enjoy it. Go have some fun with your friends and go mingle. May the fourth be with you. Always. I love you. I know. Somehow Palpatine returned. Laugh it up, fuzzball. <laughs> Be careful not to choke on your aspirations, Director. I have a bad feeling about this. Oh no. What? The disc is gone. The one with the thing for blowing up the Death Star? Are you kidding? It's supposed to be right here! This is not happening. Oh no, we are so dead! May the Force be with you. 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 May the Force be with you, Master. May the Force be with you. May the Force be with you. May the Force be with us. May the Force be with us all.